Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Forever Conscious Research Channel. Hope you're doing well today. It's great to see you. Thank you for choosing to spend part of your day with me. Okay, so. Before we get started, I'm going to ring the bell. We'll relax. Try and stay calm. In part eight. <laughs> <laughs> as much as we can. <laughs> Still breathe in. Try and center ourselves a little bit, right? <laughs> I will not explode today. I will not explode today. <laughs> All right. So again, uh, welcome back to Forever Conscious Research Channel. I appreciate you. All of you, and thank you for spending time with me and amongst yourselves. Chat is always great. Love, uh reading what you all write. I don't get to necessarily respond to a lot of it, but I know uh, I appreciate it, and there's always a lot of great conversation going on. So, okay, so we are going to be continuing with Chapter 8, and we are about 53 minutes, almost 54 minutes into Chapter 8. Now, Chapter 9... Okay, sorry. Chapter 8 is a total of 90 minutes and 53 seconds. Chap I'm sorry, did I say chapter 9? Chapter 8 is a total of 90 minutes and 53 seconds. Chapter 9 is a total of 98 minutes and 8 seconds. And then the final chapter, which is chapter 10, is 18 minutes and 36 seconds. I am going to try to finish off the book today. That's my goal. So, um... Just without commentary, we're looking at uh, probably about two and a half hours. So we're probably going to be approaching uh, well over three hours today, maybe four. Not 100% sure, but uh, the towards the end, there isn't as much to really uh put commentary on because the cases are over i think at the uh, middle to end part of chapter nine so just to make you aware of that yeah so again we're continuing with chapter eight we'll be heading into case 57 okay we're going to rewind it about uh 20 30 seconds from where we left off last stream just to make a better seamless transition here okay here we go nation comes from souls who use their light energy for conceiving designing and then manipulating the molecules and cell structure of living matter 
which possess the physical properties they want in finished form. In my last case, I learned that the artistic designer soul of Hyanth formed full-grown trees in the spirit world to see if the finished product was appropriate, and then worked backward down to the seedlings and finally to the tree cells. This is one process of creating matter for functional use. I also indicated an example of this sort of energy training in Case 35, with the creation and alteration of mice. My next case is another illustration of those souls who work with living organisms. These designer souls are the biologists and botanists of the spirit world, and they say that extraterrestrial life exists on billions of planets. I have an extensive file on souls who have incarnated on other worlds, and souls who have traveled to a variety of strange worlds for both study and recreation between their lives on Earth. Case 59 This is a distinctive case concerning a designer soul called Kala. As our session progressed, my subject spoke to me about a recent planetary assignment involving the need to adjust a problem with the ecosystem that was not going to be corrected by evolutionary adaptation. Before this case, I had not expected that souls would return to a planetary site for modifications of an existing environment, since that would mean their designs were fallible. It was revealing for me to learn Kala's experience involved the altering of the molecular chemistry of an existing creature in a controlled experiment. When clients describe their soul experiences with life on other worlds, I try to learn about the galactic location, the planet's size, orbit, the distance it lies from its star, atmospheric composition, gravitation, and topography. I suppose my background as an amateur astronomer gives me an additional incentive to learn these details. Nonetheless, many clients find it annoying to try and answer astronomy questions they consider distracting and irrelevant. In our physical universe, we know of 100 billion galaxies. Each of these silvery islands, separated by vast distances in light years, moves within the dark sea of space and contains countless billions of suns with the likelihood of life-supporting planets. Okay, let's uh, just get this on the table. That planets are not like we have been told. The solar system. And think about the word solar. Your soul is lured. Soul lured system. It's right there. Right in our face. Now as far as the composition of space and planets and all this stuff. It's not like we are we are told in the mainstream as some, you know, a lot of you already know. And when I say that, I'm saying that we this realm we live in is of a holographic nature, a very different type of hologram that is, you know, we can bang on, okay? We can feel, touch, sense, all those things, okay? Smell. It's a very high-tech interactive hologram. Now... Uh, so when you hear things like uh, about other planets and, and, and uh, you know, trying to fix them and this and that, uh, it's a common theme you hear through the so-called aliens from other planets that are channeled and uh, how there's even you have people who come and say that, you know, they came from other planets to save Earth, yada, 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 all the, you know, the same old hope, new age hope porn that you're used to. Um, point being, again, is that, yes, I have no doubt that there has to be uh, other realms similar to Earth in which this system is linked to, okay? But as far as the whole space charade it's nothing like that we're talking about more or less uh realms okay other realms just like earth is a realm you can have other realms out there that are resemble a physical nature and but again they all fall under that you know uh control structure like here 
because my celestial references have little meaning to most subjects in hypnosis, and the worlds they talk about are so far away from Earth's quadrant in space, I frequently just move on rather than impede the session. Kala tried to explain to me that her creation design training class went to a planet nowhere near Earth. She called this world Jaspir and said it was in a double binary star system, orbiting a hot yellow star nearby with a dull red larger star much farther away. I was also told Jaspir was a little larger than Earth but had smaller oceans. She added this world was semi-tropical with four moons. After a little encouragement, Kala was willing to discuss her work involving a strange creature that has certain odd similarities to animals on Earth. The average client with experience on an alien planet has feelings of reluctance about giving me information they consider to be privileged. I have mentioned this fact before in other areas of my spiritual research. Subjects clam up when they feel they should not be revealing knowledge entrusted to them, or that they are not intended to uncover in their current lives. Remember, you're not allowed. You're not allowed to have certain information. Because you, you aren't worthy. This is... This is particularly true with alien civilizations. It is frustrating for me to hear such statements as, Neither you nor I are supposed to know about such places. With Kala... I explained how important it was for both of us to know her capabilities as a soul, rather than my simply being an inquisitive investigator. Another effective hypnosis technique I might use to get around client blocks towards speaking about other worlds is to ask, Have you known any fascinating alien life forms you care a great deal about? This approach is irresistible to many souls who travel for work or play. Dr. M. Kala. I would like to further explore what you have told me about your assignment to Jaspier. I think this would help me understand your specialty. Why don't you begin with your training class and how the project on Jaspier was presented? Subject. The six of us have been assigned to work with some seniors, design masters, to deal with this world where runaway vegetation has threatened the food supply of the small land animals. Dr. N., so, basically, the problem on Jasper involves the ecosystem? Subject. Yes, the thick vines. A voracious vine-like bush. It grows so fast it kills those plants needed for the food supply. There is little space left for the land creatures of Jasper to graze. Dr. N. And they can't eat the vines? Subject. No. And that's why we went to Jasper on this assignment. Dr. N., reacting too quickly. Oh, to rid the planet of these vines. Subject. No. They are indigenous to the planet and its soil. Dr. N. Well, then, what is the assignment? Subject. To create an animal which will eat the vines. To control the spreading of this bush which chokes off so much other vegetation. Dr. N. What animal? Subject. Laughing. <laughs> it is the ranucula. Dr. N. How are you going to do that with an animal that is not indigenous to Jasper? Subject. By creating a mutation from an existing small four-footed animal and accelerating its growth. Dr. N. Kala, you can change the DNA genetic codes of one animal to create another? Subject. I could not do this by myself. We have the combined energy of my training class, plus the skillful manipulation of the two seniors who have accompanied us on this field trip. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, let's just rewind that. Very briefly. ...an animal and accelerating its growth. Dr. N. Kala, you can change the DNA genetic codes of one animal to create another? Subject. I could not do this by myself. We have the combined energy of my training class. We have the combined energy of my training class. Again, it shows how there is the lack of sovereign decision-making. So it's, it's the group dynamic. Plus the skillful manipulation of the two seniors who have accompanied us on this field trip. 
plus the skillful manipulation of the two guides on this field trip. Skillful manipulation. Do I really need to say anything else? <laughs> Dr. N, you use your energy to alter the molecular chemistry of an organism in order to circumvent natural selection? Subject, yes, to radiate the cells of a group of the small animals. We mutate the existing species, and we make it much larger so it will survive. Since we don't have the time to wait for natural selection, we will also accelerate growth of the four-legged animal. Dr. N. Do you accelerate the growth of the mutation so that the ranucula appears right away, or do you accelerate the size of the creature itself? Subject. Both. We want the ranucula to be big, and we want this evolutionary change to take place in one generation. Dr. N. How many Earth years will this take? Subject. Pause. Oh, fifty years or so. To us, it seems like a day. Dr. N. What did you do to the small animal who will become a ranucula? Subject. We keep the legs and hairy torso, but it all will be larger. Dr. N. Tell me about the finished product. What does a ranucula look like? Subject. Laughing. <laughs> oh, large curving nose down around the mouth. Big lips, huge jaws, massive forehead, walks on four legs with hooves, about the size of a horse. Dr. N., you said you kept the hair of the original animal. Subject. Creep. <laughs> yes, it's all over the ranucula. Long, reddish-brown hair. Dr. N., what about the brain of this animal? Is it greater or less than a horse? Subject. The ranucula is smarter than a horse. Dr. N. He sounds like something out of a Dr. Seuss children's book. Subject. Grins. That's why it's so much fun to think about him. Dr. N. Has the ranucula made a difference on Jasper? Subject. Yes, because he is many times the size of the original animal and has other alterations, such as his huge jaw and body strength. He is really eating up the vines. The ranucula is a docile creature with no natural predators and a voracious eater like the original animal. That's what the seniors wanted. Dr. N. What about his reproduction on this planet? Do the ranucula multiply quickly? Subject. No, they reproduce slowly. That is why we had to create quite a number of ranuculas after we programmed the desired genetic characteristics. Dr. N. Do you know how this experiment ended? Subject. Jasper is now a more balanced world of plant eaters. We wanted the other animals to thrive as well. The vines are now under control. Dr. N. Do you plan eventually to have highly intelligent life on Jasper? Is that what this is all about? Subject. Vaguely. Perhaps the seniors do. I have no way of knowing. Explorers I consider most people who gain experience in different environments outside the spirit world between lives to be a type of explorer soul. They may be souls whose personal development requires in-depth experience on different worlds or simply recreational travelers. I also have clients who engage in temporary work assignments between lives that involve travel. Explorer souls in training travel to physical and mental worlds in our universe and even into other dimensions. From the accounts I hear about, I picture a full-fledged explorer soul as a highly specialized, non-incarnating being who seeks out suitable training sites for the less experienced souls and then eventually leads them to these regions. Their work ethic is one of reconnaissance. When souls who are still incarnating on Earth move from the spirit world to other locations, these trips seem to be from point to point with no stops along the way. My clients say that in their travels to other places, they do not perceive the trips to be long or short. This is illustrated by the following two quotes. 
From the spirit world to a physical world, it is like a door opens and you see the walls of what appears to be a hallway, a tube, whirling past on either side. Then another portal-type doorway opens and you are there. When I pass into another dimension, to a mental world, I am like a piece of static flowing through a TV screen into magnetic zones structured by pure thought. The voids are composed of large, pulsating fields of energy. I feel the power of this energy more than when I go to a material universe. I feel the power of this energy more than I when I go to a material universe. Feel. That implies, again, they're openly saying energy. That feeling is given by that energy and used as some sort of decept deception uh, and manipulation method. Just as we see in near-death experiences, it's uh, no different. Again, I refer you to my commentary on Tony's NDE to see that one moment where Tony is in his natural, true essence and is not corrupted yet. But then he runs into this blue light that is a love bomb, and then everything unfolds from there. So you see the transition from Tony being in his, again, natural, true essence, his spirit self. And then all of a sudden, the blue light walks in and boom, he's interfered with because we must adapt our wave resonance to existing conditions in order to easily pass through. I want to keep my energy tight so I don't get lost. These trips are not instantaneous, but almost. Most of the souls I work with who... Ex now, let's talk about the instantaneous thing, and I think this is really, really important um, for when we leave here, Okay. Now, they're saying, uh, you know, it's it's like instantaneous, but it's not. Okay, that's kind of what we're getting off of the statement. Now, with um, astral projection and with uh, things like trip reports, DMT, ayahuasca, um, what you will see in those three things, and other trip reports too, but it, you really have to break break through the threshold to 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 see this in action sometimes again it's not going to be in every single case but it's something you need to look out for when you're researching this on your own is one who has themselves in control if they are in a, a negative situation okay and they want to leave it they only have to think it and put that fiery intention into that, okay? And boom, they end up in another realm. And why does that happen? That happens because they have put that intention out there. They don't, they have no desire to continue interacting with, let's just say this negative force. And it doesn't even have to be negative. It just could be a place that they're just not even interested in too, okay? So you see that transition period and it is instant. It's, They'll say they'll often use words like "then all of a sudden I was here, all of a sudden I was there." So they go from not wanting to be in the situation or realm, whatever the heck they're involved with, throwing that intention into it, and then boom, ending up in a completely different realm, and it is instant. Now, when I'm talking about this and how it relates to when you're crossing over, when you finally are leaving your body. This is something you have to really keep in mind and remember, because it's very important. Soon as the illusions start coming at you at death, in the form of, let's just say, your deceased loved ones, okay? We're not going to go down the whole laundry list of the possibility, but the point is, is whatever decides to insert itself into your crossover period you have to shut that damn thing down right away you say no i don't want to deal with it you know and, and put your intention on leaving this realm and any of the attached realms and then boom you you should be out of here 
because that's your intention. Your intention is not to stick around and, and roll the dice and, and talk with these damn things. It's you asserting yourself and z the equivalent of teleporting yourself out like that, okay? I suggest that you are more or less in an area of your own creation, okay? Without distractions, no visual distractions, no auditory or telepathic, we'll say auditory, but it's telepathic uh, interference is allowed. And you put up a button, a, something equivalent to like a, a energy ball of protection around you, chi ball, whatever you, whatever you prefer to term it, okay? And then you just wait it out and see, and then when you're ready, then you can go exploring again. But that's my suggestion right there. I think it's really important to remember that we have the control. We do. We have the control to consent and, and get the hell out of these situations in an instant. We do. And that's going to serve us very well, that particular knowledge, when we're crossing over. Explore other worlds are led by instructors. Also, I find those subjects who travel interdimensionally are not limited to souls in an advanced state of development. We saw this in the hide-and-seek game. They seem to be adventuresome souls who relish travel, the challenges of different environments, and new forms of self-expression. I have been told of existences where intelligent beings reside within blocks of matter so dense it is described as resembling the composition of silver and lead. Others tell me about realms appearing as shining glass surfaces amid towers of crystal. There are physical worlds consisting of fire, water, ice, or gas, where all manner of intelligent life thrives. These spheres, within which the explorer souls move, have light, pastel, or dark environments. However, the dark habitats do not bear the sinister connotations that people associate with regions of foreboding. The explorer souls do not emphasize a polarity of light and darkness in their travels as much as other elements. These could include a restless or serene environment, thin or heavy density, physical or mental domains, and conditions lending themselves to what has been described as purified or coarse intelligence. Traveler souls who move into different realms of cosmic consciousness must learn to align their energy with symmetry to local conditions within these demarcations. Explorer guides can take souls on brief visits to higher dimensional levels to raise their consciousness. In the minds of many subjects, these trips don't last long, and this is probably to avoid overwhelming younger souls. In the last chapter... Under recreational activities in the spirit world, I said that soul travel often involves working vacations. These visits are usually to physical worlds for souls from Earth and can last from a few days up to hundreds of years in Earth time. I receive a great deal of information about other worlds from discussions of a client's R&R &R periods between lives. My hypnosis subjects are usually more relaxed about giving me details of their recreational travel to other worlds, as demonstrated by the next case. Case 60. Dr. N. What activity are you most engaged in between lives when you are not reviewing karmic lessons with your soul group? Subject. Well, I do take trips, uh, but they are rather personal. I don't think I should talk about this sort of thing. Dr. N. I don't wish to make you uncomfortable with telling me things which you feel you shouldn't. Pause. Just let me ask if there is some exotic place you travel to between lives which gives you fond memories. You kind of get the impression it's not necessarily... I mean, we could, could be wrong. I'm just throwing this out there. It doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but you, I get the sense this is kind of like those other cases we've seen where information is only allowed in very small segments or not at all or there's just a you know complete blockade of everything like the soul classes we've talked about before how there's a lack of information um eh, I, but you know it could be a personal thing and they just don't want to share it but uh let's see 
Subject. Reacts quickly with a broad smile. Oh, yes. To Bruel. Dr. N. Bruel. Lowering my voice. Is this a world where you incarnate? Subject. No, I remain as a soul because I only go to Bruel to rejuvenate my spirit. And it's fun to take trips here because it is like Earth with no people. There we go. There we go. I go to rejuvenate. Okay. It's like Earth with no people. It's these rejuvenation centers, again, that we keep running into. And let's find out some more. Let's see. Dr. N, in a reassuring tone. I see. So you mostly go for rest and recreation. Why don't you tell me about the physical aspects of Bruel compared to Earth? Subject. It is smaller than Earth and colder because the sun is further away. It has mountains, trees, flowers, and fresh water, but no oceans. Dr. N. Who brings you to Bruel? Subject. Uh, a master navigator by the name of Jumu. Dr. N. Would this be the same type of soul as an explorer who is a specialist in travel, or someone like your own guide? Subject. Jumu is an explorer, all right. We call them navigators. Pause. But our guides can come with us, too, if they want. Dr. N. I understand completely. Tell me, do you usually go alone or with other members of your soul group? Subject. We could come alone, but the navigators usually bring a few members of different groups. Mm. Dr. N. What do you think of Jumu? So, yeah, again, you have navigators implying this is not... You're going on a field trip, but you got, you know, your teachers with you. Except they're parasites. <laughs> Subject, more relaxed. Zumu likes being a tour director for those of us who are taking breaks from our normal activities. Okay. He says it gives us perspective. Dr. N. That sounds interesting. I know you are anxious to explain why Bruel is great fun. So why don't we begin by my asking you about the animal life on this planet? Subject. Uh, no fish, frogs, snakes. No amphibians. Dr. N. Oh, why is that, do you think? Subject. Pause and a little confused. I don't know. Except those of us who come here want to be involved with a special land animal who is... Stops. Dr. N. Coaxing. An animal you remember? Subject. Laughs. <laughs> Our favorite. The ardor. They are like a small bear with cat features all rolled into one. Wrapping her arms around her sides. The ardor is a wonderful, furry, cuddly, peaceful animal, which is really not an animal as we know it. Dr. N. What does this mean? Subject. The ardor is very intelligent and affectionate. Dr. N. How does their intelligence compare to humans? Subject. That's difficult to say. It is not higher or lower than humans. Just different. Dr. N. What is most different? Subject. They have absolutely no need for conflict or competition among their kind. This is why we are brought to this peaceful setting. It gives us hope for a better future on Earth. What Earth could become if we all got our act together. Dr. N. Oh, please. What do you and your friends do on Bruel? Subject. We come and play with these gentle creatures who seem to... Uh, 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 if, if we got our act together... Again, this is the the never ending, never fucking ending, shitting on us because of the system that we are thrown into. And that has been this way for as far back as we have records for. I know I keep saying that, but I'm saying that for a reason, because you can look on your own and see the path of humanity has always been under the thumb of some parasitic force doesn't matter what country you live in okay now how what what other things do they like to blame things on with us oh climate change 
so-called climate change. Who's the one who provides the, the gas and the oil for the vehicles, for the factories, all this stuff? Who puts all the garbage in the water? Not us. These are systems that were in place that we were basically forced to partake in and assimilate into. And yet we're the ones always getting shit on. I'll give you an example of something hilarious that happened in my local area. There was a, this waste, not even like a landfill, but like a toxic waste dump thing. And they kept building on top of it and burying it. Well, the whole damn thing ended up uh, breaking and then going off into the ocean, okay? And then what happens is is uh, it, we have this thing where the ocean gets all kind of fucked up every once in a while. And you can't even go to the beach because it stinks. It, you, you can actually die um, if you end up swimming and you have like a cut on. You can get the really crazy bacterial infection. I mean, especially if the levels are high, the bacterial levels. But then the... The surrounding counties decide to put out a notification and tell us that it's our fault why all this is happening. Yet, this company that has this toxic dump leaks everything out into the ocean. But no, no, it couldn't possibly be them, right? No, 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 it's us. It's us. It's the never-ending uh, guilt trip, again, on humanity. Well, maybe if you got your act together... Well, you know, if this system is all so knowing, so loving, so amazing, then why don't the system step up and take care of this shit for once and once and for all? It's because it's not going to happen. It's meant to be this way. It's by design. All of this stuff. Of a connection for souls from Earth needing rest. That'd be crazy. We materialize our <laughs> energy in a minor way to interact with the ardors. Dr. N., can you be more specific about this process? Subject. Well, we assume transparent human shapes to hug them. We float into their minds. So unearthly and subtle. After we float into their minds so subtly and unearthly. Life on a hard physical world such as Earth, they heal us in this setting. The ardor is a soothing creature which motivates us to see what is possible with the human body. The setting for R&R &R is as much of a factor on these trips of exploration by souls as the attributes of the alien life forms they find here. While in trance, my subjects have great empathy for the unspoiled planets which are similar to Earth, but with no people. They look upon these places as their own special playgrounds. I don't see nearly as many clients with memories of going to mental worlds. This is natural. We are beings used to bright light and physical dimensions. The following quote is another example of interaction with a life form purely for recreation. We are taken by the travelers to the place of the Quigleys. They are the size of a muskrat, fat and fluffy, with a forehead similar to a bullnosed dolphin. The Quigley has big rounded ears and straight out whiskers. They have the IQ of perhaps a smart dog. They are devoted and happy animals who love us. Their planet is an ancient mystical land of gently rolling hills and valleys, carpeted with flowers and small delicate trees. It is very amazing. Yet again, we have something resembling Earth's nature. Kind of funny, isn't it? Another realm we run into that has Earth-like features. Why is that? Because, again, it's part of the whole control system. It keeps you familiarized with this bullshit as you go from realm to realm, incarnation to incarnation. It is a... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh forget i can't think of it right now something like a streamlined setting you know it's uh, familiarizing keeping you familiar with the surroundings which 
again, sucks you in because, you know, what? You, you come down, you can look at some beautiful trees, grass, mountains, clouds, yada, 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 animals. And then it only makes sense that the system would have those same things out in the astral realm and uh, other material realms related to it to continually condition you. It's subliminal programming all over the place. Right here. And there is an inland body of fresh water. We relax and play in this world of perfect peace. If we have dreams of being tall giants, very short elfin-appearing beings, or having the bodies of water and air creatures, this could mean these dreams reflect unconscious memories of a prior incarnation on another world. However... It is also just as likely we were associated with this type of entity on R&R visits to some exotic world. Much of our mythology about strange creatures may also stem from these memories. I should add that most people have dreams of being able to fly. This probably relates more to our memories of floating around life as a soul in a disembodied state than being a flying creature in a former life. In order to appreciate the symbiotic relationship between an earthly soul who has had associations with other forms of life, let's examine the next excerpt from one of my cases who is a hybrid soul. In the following quote of a fond memory, my client became very nostalgic. Sometimes a hybrid soul will tell me about being taken by an explorer soul between lives to a world similar to that of their first physical incarnations. Between my lives on Earth, I visit a water world called Anturium, which is so restful after a difficult life on land. Anturium has only one landmass, the size of Iceland. I come with. For any Stern fans out there, doesn't it sound like Ed Torian? You're being deceptive. A few of my friends who also have an affinity to water. We are brought by an explorer guide who is familiar with this region. Here we join the Cratons who look a little like whales. They are telepathic and a long-lived race who do not mind our coming and mentally connecting with them for a while. Occasionally, they gather at certain locations to telepathically communicate with intelligent aquatic forms who exist on two other planets, around stars in the galactic vicinity of Anturium. What I love about this place is the unity of harmony and thought with the Cratons which rejuvenates my mind and reminds me of my original planet. Apparently, the Cratons have the ability to project their minds as beacons of unified thought away from Anturium to other worlds by knowing the points of confluence in the magnetic energy belt around their planet. These vortex areas, similar to the ley lines of Earth discussed in Chapter 4, seem to give the Cratons' telepathic power a boost and serve as conduits to better interstellar communication. From this case, and hundreds of others, I have come to the conclusion that everything on Earth and in the universe is apparently connected by thought waves to and from the spirit world. This may also be true for other dimensions near us as well. The multiple progression of intelligence, with all elements of matter, represents a symphony of order and direction based upon a plan of universal consciousness. In the last chapter, I explained how some recreational games are used as training vehicles for the souls attracted to exploration. The more adept engage in interdimensional travel. One of my explorer trainee clients said to me, I was told that to become an explorer I would have to experience many realities by beginning my travels to physical worlds and then escalating to the mental existences and interdimensional travel. In order to acquaint the listener with interdimensional life, I have chosen the strange case of a client from Japan who told me in deep hypnosis that his soul was originally from another dimension. His spiritual name is Kano. Case 61 Kano is a Japanese scientist who, years ago, came to the U.S. for his advanced education. Today he prefers a life of relative isolation in laboratories. He suffers from a poor immune system, a common complaint among hybrid soul clients. These people are negatively influenced by too little experience with the human body 
and too many alien imprints carried over from their former existences. As I have said, By it design. may take the hybrid soul many generations of earthly incarnations before a complete memory cleansing of old body energy patterns will take place. I began our session in my customary fashion, by regressing Kano to the time when he was inside his mother's womb. This is a good place for a spiritual regressionist to start interacting with a client's soul. While inside his mother, my subject reported that he had trepidations about his coming birth, stemming from his one prior life on earth some 300 years ago in India. I continued the regression. I bet we all have a lot of trepidations when we're in the womb. It's like, uh, you want to see a really interesting case, check out my pre-birth memories video from a few months ago. Oh boy, you, you got to hear that guy's story. Incredible. My subject reported that he had trepidations about his coming birth, stemming from his one prior life on earth some 300 years ago in India. I continued the regression to Kano's death scene in India, and then we crossed into the spirit world. I will pick up the dialogue with Kano when he meets his guide, Finnis. Dr. N. What does Finnis say to you? Subject. She says, Welcome back. How did you like the ride? Dr. N. And what is your response? Subject. Did it have to be so terrible? Dr. N. Does she agree with your assessment of life in India? Subject. Finnis reminds me that I volunteered to have a difficult opening life on Earth because I wanted to receive the full impact of a disruptive planet. I was the poorest of the poor in India and lived in squalor. Dr. N. Did you want to suffer this much in your initial life? Subject. The life was terrible and I didn't handle it well. When a childless family took my daughter against my will by paying the owner of the shack where I lived, I became so distraught I could not function. Kano jerks in his chair and emotionally relives the moments after his last death. What kind of a planet is this anyway? People selling children. Doctor, Boy, that's what I fucking want to know. And that is one thing. One thing. Okay? Out of a laundry list of atrocities going on. Despicable shit. And this reality is supposed to be a learning experience and growth and all that shit. Get the fuck out of here. All right, I'm sorry. That's, that, this is what drives me. Atrocities. The, the constant, constant attack of sovereignty and just... Ugh, just vile shit. Vile. And at this point, I do not yet know about Kano's hybrid origins, and I make a wrong assumption. This does seem as though it was a very difficult first incarnation for a new soul on Earth. Subject. Who said I was a new soul? Dr. N. I'm sorry, Kano. I just assumed that right now you are only in your second incarnation on Earth. Subject. That's true, but I'm from another dimension. Dr. N. Startled. Oh. Then what can you tell me about this other dimension? Subject. We had no physical worlds as you have in this dimension. My incarnations were on a mental world. Dr. N. What did you look like on this world? Subject. I had an elongated flowing body, spongy with no skeletal structure. We were rather transparent forms of silvery light. Dr. N. Did you prefer a certain type of gender? Subject. We were all hermaphrodites. Dr. N. Kano, please explain the difference between traveling to the dimension of your origins from the spirit world as opposed to coming into our universe. Now, just before this continues, we're going to hear it out. But most of the time, what you're going to notice when you hear good old Dr. Newton, talk about these uh, origin stories. The, f the few that we see, or the sometimes we get some hints here and there where, where a patient just blurts it out. What you're going to notice almost every time is that 
it's part of this system. Okay, let's not fool ourselves. It's it has excuse me, this is not about the origins the true origin story of this specific spirit soul or spirit I should say. Soul is related to this system. Okay, spirit is your true essence. And wondering where that comes from. We're going to probably find out that they're going to give us some hints that it sure as hell isn't the origin. It's the origin of probably the existence in this system. Subject. In my dimension, movement is like going through soft, translucent filaments of light. Coming into your universe is like plowing through thick, heavy, moisture-laden fog. Dr. N., and being on Earth for the first time, what was that like compared to your home world? Subject. Having concrete tied to your feet. The first thing you notice is the heavy weight of the dense energy here compared to a mental world. And just so you know, the heavy weight, that is a very, very common type of phrase. Uh, people will say in pre-birth memories and life between lives... Uh, they will talk about how when arriving here, it's very dense, very heavy. There's a disconnect. These are common, common words that you're going to hear in your own research uh, as you plow through these things on your own. Pause. It isn't just heavy. It's coarse. Severe. I was really jolted in that life in India. Dr. N., is all this a little better now? Are you becoming acclimatized? Subject, without confidence. To some extent, it's still pretty difficult. Dr. N., I can see that. Kana, what is the most troubling aspect about the human brain for you? Huh. Subject, abruptly. Ah, it's the impulsive behavior, the physical reaction to things, without analytical thought. There is danger in connecting with the wrong kind of human being, too. Treachery. I can't deal with this. Doc yeah, I, uh, I can't deal with it either. And, um, yeah, I'm kind of uh, asserting my sovereignty and would like to leave now, please. <laughs> it's like, come on. Uh, the brain and the life script, the soul, the spirit are all working in unison and you're it's such a battle it's a battle the deck is so stacked against you when you incarnate here it's not even funny it really it's it's disgraceful because it's so easy to get lost it's so easy to get wrapped in things and not concentrate on trying to rediscover yourself while you're here and that's all by design the whole realm is designed to try and get you to lose yourself and go as deep as possible to the point where it's almost you know not almost, it's very difficult to regain yourself but with enough effort and desire for answers and growth boy can this place really start to show itself and in turn you start to see your true, true essence shine. And it's it's a great, great thing. The problem is, is there's still that damn limitation by the damn body. Ugh, still there. To N. Kano is sweating profusely, and I quiet him now a bit before continuing. Tell me about your mental world. Does it have a name? Subject. Pause. It's a sound which I can't recreate with my voice. Begins reminiscing. We float in a sea of gentle mental currents. Soft. Playful. So unlike Earth. Dr. N. Then why come here? Subject. With a deep sigh. I am studying to be an explorer teacher. Most of my associates are satisfied to confine their efforts to one dimension. I finally told Finnis I wanted broader experience with a hard world in a completely different zone of existence. 
She told me she had a senior colleague who recommended another dimension with a strenuous physical world that had a reputation for producing vigorous, insightful souls. With a gallows laugh. Once you survive the lessons. This was Earth. Dr. N. Did you get the impression there were other choices open to you? Subject. Shrugs. Guides don't give you many choices in such situations. Finnis said that when a... Guides don't give you many situations. Did you get the impression there were other choices open to you? Subject. Shrugs. Guides don't give you many choices in such situations. They don't give you many choices in such situations. Sounds like the guides really have a lot of control, huh? But that's control that we've given them. We're not going to give that anymore. Those days are over. They have jack shit for control over us. It's over. Finnis said that when I completed my work on Earth, Finnis. I would be strengthened in ways my friends who refused such assignments would not be. She said, Earth would also be quite interesting. And I accepted that. Oh, yeah. Dr. N., did any of your friends come with you into our dimension? Subject. No. I was the only one who elected to go, and I almost refused to return again in this life. My associates think I am very brave. They know if I make it, I'm going to be an effective traveler. Okay, so again, we see the group dynamic, the bullshit master dynamic, teacher dynamic, and it is rearing its ugly head and convincing this poor spirit to go along even though you can tell they don't want to and is oh yeah it's gonna it's really gonna pay off this time really it's gonna pay off time i swear this will be your last incarnation you could just picture the bullshit going on in this conversation that even though we have very little access to it you could just tell how this whole thing works that uh it's 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 um peer pressure that's really what it is. It's peer pressure and eventually just caving and giving in and saying, oh, okay, fine, I'll go down to Earth. And this time, and they, you know, they hype you up and get you all excited as if this time's really going to be different, I promise. And then, you, you know, you go through this nightmare again and, <laughs> well, until you figure it out that you're in a reincarnation soul trap matrix, well... Not much is really going to ever change until you find out who you truly are and how much power you truly have and how you can use that power to decide whether you want to partake in this bullshit again or not. Dr. N. Let's talk about travel, Kano. As an interdimensional traveler, you probably know if there is a finite number of dimensions around our physical universe. Subject, flatly. I do not know. Dr. N. Cautiously. Well, is your home dimension next to ours? Subject. No. I must pass through three other dimensions to get here. Dr. N. Kano, it would be helpful if you would try and describe what you see as you pass through these dimensions you are familiar with in your travels. Subject. The first dimension is a sphere full of colors and violent explosions of light, sound, and energy. I think it is still forming. The next is black and empty. We call it the unused sphere. Then there is a beautiful dimension, which has both physical and mental worlds composed of gentle emotion, tender elements, and keen thought. This dimension is superior to my original dimension, and your universe as well. Dr. N. It's now your universe too, Kano. Tell me, does the trip through the total of four dimensions take long? Subject. No, quickly. Like air particles passing through a filter. Dr. N. Can you give me a sense of the structural design between these dimensions in relation to the spirit world? You describe the dimensions as spheres. Why don't we start with that? Subject. Long pause. I can't tell you much. Everything is... in a circle around the center of the spirit world. 
Each of these universes appears to me to be an interlocking sphere within the next, as in a chain. Dr. N., after failing to gain more information. How are you getting on in our universe now, Kano? Subject, rubbing his hand on his forehead. Better. I am learning how to discharge my energy in a steady positive stream without depleting my reserve. It helps me to be away from people for long periods. I expect to really improve after a few more lives, but I am looking forward to completing my time here on Earth. Before leaving the realm of the explorer's soul, I should add that this sort of training involves learning about the texture of intelligent energy. I am frustrated in not being able to discover more about the properties of this energy in motion on mental worlds. Some information comes to me from those souls who have had experience on physical worlds, which are also considered mental, as demonstrated by the following condensed quote. We visit the volcanic gas world of Cryon to learn by assimilation. It is a mental world with outward physical attributes. Our group of explorers float as blobs of fluid energy in a sea of gaseous substances. We are metamorphic and able to change shape and form into the tiny beings whose life is centered around pure thought. There is absolute vibrational uniformity here, unlike Earth. Souls who travel interdimensionally explain that their movements appear to be in and out of curved spheres connected by zones that are opened and closed by converging vibrational attunement. Explorer trainees have to learn this skill. From the accounts I have heard, the interdimensional travelers must also learn about the surface boundaries of zones connecting universes, as hikers locating trailheads between mountain ranges. Souls speak of points, lines and surfaces in multi-space which indicate larger structural solids, at least for the physical universes. I would think dimensions having geometric designs need hyperspace to hold them. Yet explorer souls travel so fast in some sort of hyperspace, it seems to me the essence of speed, time, and direction of travel is hardly definitive. Training to be an explorer must indeed be formidable, as indicated by this quote from a client who travels through five dimensions between her lives. These dimensions are meshed with one another, so that I have no sense of boundaries except for two elements, sound and color. With sound, I must learn to attune my energy to the vibrational frequency of each dimension, and some are so complex I cannot yet go to them. With color, the purples, blues, yellows, Reds and whites are manifestations of light and density for those energy particles in the dimensions where I travel. 9. The Ring of Destiny The Screening Room of Future Lives The place of future life selection is seen as a sphere containing highly concentrated force fields of glowing energy screens, as I mentioned in the section on spiritual libraries, the place of life selection has been characterized as the ring of destiny, where we first behold our next body. Most subjects see the ring as a circular domed theater with floor-to-ceiling panoramic screens, which surround them completely while they are situated in a shadowed viewing area. Some people see the screens as being on two or three sides while they stand or sit on a raised deck. From this observation deck, souls can look up, straight ahead, or down at the screens that are huge compared to what is seen in the other learning centers of the spirit world. The ring displays futuristic scenes of events and people the soul will encounter in the life to come. Some clients have commented that each screen reflects scenes of childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and old age of the bodies they are reviewing while others say that all the screens show them the same scene at one time. The whole spiritual structure of the screening room is designed to give the viewer an ability either to observe or participate in the action, just as in libraries. It does seem to me that more people elect to enter the screens of the ring during life selection than with the screens in the other learning centers. They want to actually experience snippets of future events in certain bodies before making any final decisions. 
The preference to enter a scene or just observe is always left up to the individual soul. As with the smaller consoles, the ring also has what appears to be control panels or lever bars to monitor the action. People call this procedure scanning the timelines, and the more advanced tell me they can control the array of events in front of them with their minds. The sequence of events can, to some extent, be regulated in stop-action for parts of a future life the soul may wish to consider more carefully. I cannot stress too much that all my subjects feel what they are seeing has been edited for their benefit, and that they have less control over what they can watch than, say, in the library. Moreover, I have the impression that when looking into the future, they see more of an early life than later. This may be due to bias in reporting, since those years are already over by the time I see the client. The key viewing years of a new life seem to be between 8 and 20, when the first major forks in life begin to emerge. Many people tell me they are shown certain years in great detail, while other parts of their future life are completely left out. The control panels seem to be of no use here, yet this part never bothers my subjects. I believe their current amnesia also plays a part. I believe their current amnesia also plays a part. So we have control panels, we have amnesia. Boy, a lot of good stuff going on here. I mean, really, think about that. Think about how, I mean, really, this is a convincing truth right in our face. Among God knows how many other examples. All of this is available. Again, I have access to no special information. Everybody has access to the same thing I have. And it's just a matter of plowing through it on your own if you need convincing. And uh, it's the most rewarding research you can ever do for yourself. The key viewing years of a new life seem to be between 8 and 20 when the first major forks in life begin to emerge. Many people tell me they are shown certain years in great detail, while other parts of their future life are completely left out. The control panels seem to be of no use here, yet this part never bothers my subjects. I believe their current amnesia also plays a part. Their current amnesia also plays a part. Just saying it again. As one 49-year-old man explained, I was shown my current body at ages 4, 16, and 28, but I think I am now being blocked from recalling what I saw afterwards. I'm being blocked from what I saw afterwards. <clears throat> I'm being blocked. Something has that power to block and cover those memories up. During viewing, the screens ebb and flow like a film of water. One woman used a suitable metaphor to represent her feelings about the experience when she said, As the screens come alive, they resemble a three-dimensional underwater aquarium. When I look at a life, it's like taking a deep breath and going underwater. People, places, events, everything floats by you in a flash before your eyes, as if you are drowning. Yeah, and it's a uh, similar concept to what we see in the life review with near-death experiences. It's no different. Uh, you know, except they're talking about how it's underwater and this and that. But, you know, you hear time and time again, people say that, you know, that they, they see these screens or life flashes before them at a rapid pace. They experience everything from multiple angles, uh, specifically when they may have hurt somebody. You will relive that experience as the uh, person you hurt. So you get the full-on interactive experience of suffering and guilt and shame. No matter how big or how small that moment may be, the Matrix makes sure to throw those in there to... Um, uh, how do I put this? Um, the guilt trip you into thinking that you can do it better next time. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you kind of fucked up this incarnation, but... Mm. We're gonna, we're gonna, we since we are so nice and so loving and so caring about you and your spiritual growth. Well, 
we're going to make you an offer that you should be grateful for. And that's to come back into a body. <laughs> then you come back to the surface. When you are actually sampling a scene from the life they show you, it reflects the time a person is able to stay underwater. In many ways, uncovering the memories my subjects have about their last experience in the life selection room and their interpretations as to body choice is one of the most therapeutic and informative aspects of my hypnosis sessions. My clinical work is greatly enhanced when a client returns to the ring because of the relevancy to their current life. By offering the listener a more comprehensive picture of this process, I hope to bring a greater appreciation of the importance of each life we select in our cycle of lives. This chapter contains one final soul specialty that I will add to my list. These are the Time Masters, who are coordinators engaged with past, present, and future timelines of people and events. The Time Masters. The Time Masters. Masters. Time Masters are the highly adroit experts who give the impression of actually directing the presentations in our theater in the round. These master souls are members of an entire fellowship of planners that include guides, archivists, and council elders who are involved with designing our future. A large percentage of my subjects never see Time Masters in the screening room. Some clients feel they are alone in the ring except for a projectionist. Others will enter the ring with a personal guide, or perhaps an elder, who is the only advisor they are aware of helping them during life selection. In terms of our own input, many souls have already organized their thoughts about the next reincarnation. Our guides and council members have helped refine these thoughts with questions about what we think our next life should be about, and the type of human being that might best suit us. Still, we are not really prepared for the choices offered to us once we enter the life selection room. There is a sense of wonder, and even some apprehension for the average soul. The time masters of the ring seem to be shadowy figures in the background, who may be consulted by those guides who accompany us to the viewing areas. Even if they are seen, my clients are not inclined to communicate with them during observations. This is why my next case is atypical. Case 62. Dr. N. Please give me a picture of what takes place as you enter the sphere of life selection. Subject. There are two beings who come forward to work with my guide, Fayum. He seems to know them well. Dr. There are two beings that come forward to work with my guide. So you see how the guides... They have this system of reporting that they have to abide by, too. It's, uh, again, nothing goes unchecked. You have to be a real, real parasite and piece of shit to make yourself uh, uh, in the upper echelon of this control matrix. Please give me a picture of what takes place as you enter the sphere of life selection. Subject. There are two beings who come forward to work with my guide, Fayum. He seems to know them well. Dr. N., do you see them in this place before every new life? Subject, no, only when the next life is going to be particularly difficult, which means a number of hard body choices. Dr. N., do you mean more body choices than usual, or more complex individual bodies? Subject, hmm. Usually, I get only a couple of body choices, and that makes it easier for me. Dr. N. Do you know the names of these two specialists who talk to Fayum? Subject. Jerks in chair. Never. That's just not something I would know. There isn't any easy familiarity here with these masters of time. Yes, it's, it's not easy. Jerks in the chair. Oh, my God. It's like, what is that, like a cattle prod? All of a sudden, how dare you ask that question? How you are not capable enough, not advanced enough spiritually in your growth to be worthy of such a 
revelation and uh, reveal, I should say, of these parasites that my, uh, my master and I answer to. Never. Not allowed. That's why Fiam is with me. Dr. N, yeah, okay. I understand. So do your best to give me an idea of what these time masters of your life offerings are like. Subject, more relaxed now. Okay. Number one is masculine appearing, and he is rigorous in his demeanor. I know he is inclined toward having me choose a certain body, the one which will be the most useful. And probably the most difficult. This body will give me the maximum experience I need in my future life. Maximum. Dr. N. Oh, from what I have heard, the ring directors are rather quiet, unobtrusive beings. Subject. Sure. Well, yes, that's true. But during the choosing, there is always a preferred body choice that the planners feel is best. This body is given a prominent presentation. Pause. Everyone. It's given a prominent presentation. It's kind of like, again, with Soul. You know, all I think about is Soul, how they're going through the, I think, the Hall of You or something like that, or or the, something like that, you know, and they show the different moments in your life, uh, the fun, great moments, the shitty moments, and the, you know, your career etc. family. Knows this is the first time I have seen these choices, and they want my choice to be fruitful. Dr. N., so I have heard. Why don't you tell me about number two? Subject, smiling. She is feminine and softer, more flexible. She wants me to accept the body which will be pleasurable to be inside. She leans to moderation and turns to one and says there is plenty of time to learn my lessons. I have the feeling... There's plenty of time to learn your lessons. That's right. There's plenty of incarnations for you to learn your lesson. So you step in line. We might be nice to you this time. But in the long run, trust me, we got you. There is a deliberate juxtaposition between them for my benefit. Dr. N., Sort of like the good cop, bad cop routine during an interrogation? Subject. Laughs. Yeah, maybe. So I will have an advocate in both camps, with Fiam taking the middle road. I think it's hilarious, because I brought this up before um, in Journey of Souls, how that's exactly what it seems like. You have good cop, bad cop. And we see that in the council meetings. We see that with the guides and the group dynamic. I mean, it's just, that's what you have. You have the good cop, bad cop to just, you know, weasel in and try and uh, muscle the consent out of somebody. Dr. N. So Fiam is kind of a referee? Subject. No, that's not true. Fiam is neither lenient nor severe in attitude as I deliberate my choices. It is made clear to me that the body choice is mine alone because I am going to have to live with it. A burst of laughter. The body choice is not the choice. We heard earlier that there were two choices with this specific being. Okay? And they, and the system mostly chooses it but you have to approve of it but again you have the good cop bad cop routine you have the peer pressure all this stuff going on in the background to muscle you into consenting and agreeing to something that you will come down to and most likely result in uh high level suffering in <laughs> i mean come on subject no that's not true no. Fiam is neither lenient nor severe in attitude as I deliberate my choices. Good old Fiam. It is made clear to me that the body choice is mine alone because I am going to have to live with it. A burst of laughter. Hey, I made a pun. Dr. N. Jesus. I think you did. We really do have to live with our choices. Why don't you explain what choosing the body you had in your last life was all about before we go further? Subject. In my last life, 
I chose a difficult path with the body of a woman who would die within two years of marriage. My husband in that life needed to feel the loss of someone he loved deeply for a karmic debt from the life before. Yes, yes. He he needed to feel that. He needed to know. He needed to have that experience. He needed to be so happy, ends up finding a great wife, awesome relationship, and then they get married, and two years in, bam! Well, that's your karmic bullshit. Now get in line and start suffering and embrace it because it's a learning experience. It's all about love and light. Thank you. Come again soon. Dr. N. So there was a high probability that this particular body was going to die young. And the main question was, would you be the soul who would elect to choose that body? Subject. Yes, that's about it. Dr. N. Well, please go on and tell me the circumstances surrounding your death as a young woman in that life. Subject. In the screening room, I saw I had three choices of death during a narrow time span involving my life on a ranch near Amarillo, Texas. I could die quickly from a stray bullet during a gunfight between two drunken men. I could die more slowly after a fall from a bucking horse, and I could die by drowning in a river. Dr. N. Those sound like some great options. Let's, let's listen to him again. You know, it's, it's, it sounds wonderful. I had three choices of death during a narrow time span <laughs> involving my life on a ranch near Amarillo, Texas. I could die quickly from a stray bullet during a gunfight between two drunken men. I could die more slowly after a fall from a bucking horse. And I could die by drowning in a river. I mean, really, that's a, that's a trifecta of choices right there, brothers and sisters. Woo-wee. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> you can't help but laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> you gotta laugh. Dr. N, was there any <laughs> chance you might live? Holy Subject. Shit. Pause. A slight one, but that would defeat the purpose of my joining with that body. Dr. N. Which was what? Subject. My soulmate and I chose to be husband and wife on this ranch because he needed the lesson. I rejected the other body choices. I came to help him. Dr. N. Tell me what was on your mind as you looked at the three choices in the screening room. Subject. I chose the bullet, naturally. The manner of my death was not about these choices as much as the meaning behind my dying young. Yes, very meaningful. The listener may wonder about the connection of the laws of karma to future possibilities and probabilities. Karma does not only pertain to our deeds, it is internal as well, reflecting our thoughts, feelings, and impulses, all relating to cause and effect. Karma is more than taking proper actions toward others. It is also having the intention to do so. While the timeline for the Amarillo woman had a high probability of being short, her early death was not chiseled in stone. One of the variables here was the type of soul that would occupy that particular body. Even with the soul who elected to take this body anticipating a short life, there were elements of free will to be considered. I learned that it was not 100% ordained that this woman would die young by the stray bullet that hit her while she was standing across the street from the saloon where the gunfight took place. When I asked if she might have avoided going into Amarillo for supplies that day, my client said, Yes, but something impelled me to go into town right when I did, and I almost didn't go without knowing why. Another soul might not have gone at the last minute without knowing why either. Timelines and body choices. Okay, before we go into the timelines and body choices, I just want to point out a great comment that was made in the chat by our buddy uh, Hattie. Hattie, I'm sorry, sometimes I don't know how you pronounce it actually, but he says karma is uh, reincarnation sorcery. I think that is a great way to describe it, and I couldn't agree more. Well said, my friend. Well said. Without knowing why. Another soul might not have gone at the last minute 
without knowing why either. Timelines and Body Choices Although time has little relevance outside our physical universe, we see ourselves and everything around us aging each day. We live on a planet around a star, which is also constantly aging in chronological time. The cycle of life involves movement of time, and the timelines of our dimensional reality appear to be influenced by advanced beings who allow reincarnating souls to study the past and see into the future. In libraries and spiritual learning centers, we can view other possible actions we might have taken in former lives to explore the what-ifs of our past. Under the doctrine of free will, the events of the past were not inevitable any more than our actions within those events. Fate does not decree that a certain situation has to come out a particular way. We are not puppets on a string. In our universe, when the past is over, these events and the people involved with them become eternal and are forever preserved in spiritual libraries. Since past, present, and future in chronological time represent now time in the spirit world, how is future time treated in the ring of life selection? In Chapter 5, following Case 30, I postulated on the many possibilities for the same event existing in parallel universes. In physical universes, this hypothesis means planets such as Earth could be duplicated within the same time frames and exist simultaneously as moving particle waves of light energy. Universes might be parallel, superimposed coexisting realities within the same dimension, or something else inconceivable. Regardless of the spatial layout, from the true reality of the spirit world, time and events are tracked, stopped, and moved forward and backward by examiners of Earth. The major trunk lines, which I call baselines, are the probabilities of future events in certain bodies presented as possibilities for our examination in the ring. The waves of past events will indelibly exist, as in spiritual libraries, but if the present and future also exist in now time, how can the future be changed when the past is not? Is this an impossible paradox? In quantum mechanics, Particles of light seem to vanish at one point and reappear instantaneously in another place. If each event in time exists along wave-like ripples of probabilities and possibilities, is it likely that a past event is given certain eternal properties where future events are still fluid and open to change? My strong feeling is yes. However, after years of listening to people explain about their life choices, I do not believe future alternatives are unlimited in number. There is no need for our choices in life to be infinite. These possibilities only have to be varied enough for us to learn from the lessons. For example, in Case 29, Amy indicated to me from a past life review in the library that her alternative choices to suicide began to fall off the chart of possibilities after a while. The planners deal in the what-ifs of our lives. Events which have not yet taken place in the grand scheme of things. The planners. The planners. You in the library. That her alternative choices to suicide began to fall off the chart of possibilities after a while. The planners deal in the what-ifs of our lives. Events which have not yet taken place in the grand scheme of things. Are That's not called the free will aspect of things. Events which have not yet taken place in the grand scheme of things are known by time masters and others for their greater or lesser potential of happening. We do not simply study alternate timelines of future events in the ring. Rather, we examine the alternative bodies offered us that will exist within those events. These bodies will be born into roughly the same time frames. Watching the most probable series of events linked to those bodies under consideration is like previewing advanced promotional scenes from a movie. As they view specific scenes of what the Time Masters want them to see, some souls feel they are playing a chess game where they don't yet know all the possible moves available for a desired ending. Usually, souls look at the parts of a future life on a baseline 
or ring line, as some clients call it. The ring line represents the greatest possible course of a life for each body examined. The soul preparing for incarnation knows that one chess move, one minute change in the game they are watching, could alter the outcome. I find it intriguing that most of the time souls are not shown any in-depth probable future outcomes. They know there are many other possible moves on the chessboard of life, which can change at any moment of play. Frankly, this is what makes the game interesting for most souls. Changes in life are conditional on our free will toward a certain action. The causality is part of the laws of karma. Karma is opportunity, but it also involves fortitude and endurance, because the game will bring setbacks and losses, along with personal victories. Reports of what goes on in these screening rooms are very consistent between hypnosis subjects. Their affirmations of what they all see boggle the mind. Still, while in the ring, people are not able to view events into the future beyond the next immediate lifespan of the bodies presented to them. Evidently, this might cloud the way souls see the lives they are viewing. Taking my cue from this spirit world practice, I pre- they, they make might cloud uh, the bullshit. Okay, that's that's the translation for that one. We'll see. Boggle the mind. Still, while in the ring, people are not able to view events into the future beyond the next immediate lifespan of the bodies presented to them. Evidently, this might cloud the way souls see the lives they are viewing. Taking my cue from this spirit world practice, I prefer not to work with progression in hypnosis except in spiritual screening rooms. Once in a while, in conjunction with something else under discussion out of the ring, a subject will get brief flashes of scenes where they are participating in a future event, such as being on a starship. I usually don't push for more information here. Moreover, these flashes of future existences are mercurial, since people may only see a single possibility that could change when the time actually arrives, owing to a whole host of new circumstances and decisions based upon the timelines of history leading up to these events. The screening rooms are helpful to those souls with reservations about accepting a covenant for the next life. For many, observing certain aspects of their future gives them confidence. Nevertheless, some apprehensive souls have... Yeah, and then they get here and they realize, Oh, shit! What the hell did I get myself into? And their life script unfolds with little deviation here and there that you can throw in for free will. But even then, we all know that free will is extremely, extremely limited while you're here. You do have some. It doesn't not exist, but it barely exists. Let's put it that way. Based upon the timelines of history leading up to these events, the screening rooms are helpful to those souls with reservations about accepting a covenant for the next life. Yeah. For many, observing certain aspects of their future gives them confidence. Nevertheless, some apprehensive souls have said they refuse to enter the screens to directly sample bodies for fear they might lose their nerve in accepting a difficult life contract. For fear they might lose their nerve in picking out a difficult life script. Hear that again. Very important, my friends. Aspects of their future gives them confidence. Nevertheless, some apprehensive souls have said they refuse to enter the screens to directly sample bodies for fear they might lose their nerve in accepting a difficult life contract. Can you believe that? Okay, I'm just going to breathe. Let's move on. The more intrepid souls feel the screening room is designed to foster just the opposite reaction, because you are allowed to test the waters before jumping in. A poignant example of someone preparing for a trial is the selection of a homosexual body. Since a predisposition to being a gay or lesbian person is essentially biological, and not the result of social learning or environment, these bodies are picked by souls for two basic reasons. As I have said before, at levels 1 and 2, 
Many souls choose bodies of one particular gender around 75% of the time because they are comfortable being male or female. I find that my gay and lesbian clients have started the process of alternating gender choices in their lives, which is reflective of the more developed soul. Choosing to be a gay male or lesbian female is one means of affecting that transition in a particular life. Thus, their current sex may not be as familiar to them as the body of the opposite sex, such as a gay male feeling as if he is actually in the body of a female. The second and far more important factor is souls choosing a gay or lesbian orientation in advance of the life they are now living because they deliberately chose to exist in a society that would be prejudiced against them. My gay and lesbian clients are usually not young, inexperienced souls. If they go public, this means these people have decided to live a life where they will be swimming upstream in a culture with rigid gender role stereotypes. They must try and rise above public abuse in order to find self-esteem and self-identity. This takes daring and resolve, which I see when I take these clients back to the life selection room when these decisions were made. To illustrate all this, I had a gay male client who was once an empress in China. After a long wait, he was in his first incarnation since that life of luxury and power. This soul, known as Jemona, explained that as an empress, he was in the body of a strikingly beautiful woman who wore a fortune in jewels and was waited on hand and foot, befitting her rank. It was a life of self-indulgence, lack of trust in everyone around her due to court intrigue, and adulation by her subjects. In the life selection room, just before Jamona's current life, there were three body choices. This is what my client had to say about his decision. Of my three choices, two were women, and one was a handsome young man, who, I was told, was feminine inside. One woman was very thin, almost frail-looking, who was to live a quiet life of a devoted wife and mother. The other woman was chic, kind of flashy, and destined to be a society gadfly. She was also emotionally cold. I chose the man because I would have to cope with a life of homosexuality. I knew if I could overcome the shame of society, it would offset my life of adulation as an empress. These selections were in keeping with the usual spread of body choices, the attractive society woman would simply have been an extension of my client's former life as a public figure who was self-absorbed and envied. The housewife would not have been a poor choice. Here was a middle-of-the-road offering where Jamona would have learned to be humble and accept life's trials in poor circumstances. Even so, the candidate was another woman, and Jamona wanted to break a long cycle of being in female bodies. Choosing the life of a gay man, according to Jamona, was the hardest one, although he has been much more financially secure than the woman of ordinary means. We are not coached during these selections, but the older souls know there is often one tempting choice which would not test us very much. Jamona knew this was the society woman. He made his choice not because he was pushed into selecting the leading candidate of the gay male, but because the trial was clearly the hardest. My client told me, There have been many people in my life who have treated me with disgust and even loathing. I needed to experience this discrimination, to feel unsafe and vulnerable. Yeah, I needed to experience this to feel unsafe and vulnerable. That, you know, that was part of my life script. You know, it makes things so much easier when I'm down here, you know, to deal with all, with all that. Yeah, a lot of fun. Trial was clearly the hardest. My client told me, There have been many people in my life who have treated me with disgust and even loathing. I needed to experience this discrimination, to feel unsafe and vulnerable. One thing I have noticed in the selection of bodies is that the more advanced souls are able to make insightful comparisons between the bodies offered them within the time periods that are presented. I also see many less advanced souls accept the body they know they ought to choose as the best course of action. They trust the selection process more than themselves. A client said, For me, getting a new body is like trying on a new suit of clothes off the rack, which you want to buy and hope it won't need alterations. Time Masters Only once 
every few years does it okay so what we're gonna do is take a five minute break so feel free to chat amongst yourself take a break yourself and we will meet up here in a short amount of time and continue on with chapter nine just to give you a heads up we're 24 minutes and 50 seconds in see you in a moment
Alright, hello? What the fuck? Alright, I think it's back. I really don't know what the hell that was all about. Nothing changed. <laughs> Nothing fucking changed. <laughs> all right. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to understand how that one happened. Nothing changes. My settings are always the same. Anyways. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So... Let's get right back into it. We are continuing with chapter 9. Just to give you a heads up, we are 24 minutes and 50 seconds into chapter 9. Chapter 9 has a total of 98 minutes. Chapter 10, which will be the final chapter, has a total of 18 minutes and 36 seconds. So, with commentary, we still have a little ways to go, but uh, we're getting close. So, hang in there with me, my friends, and let's continue said for me getting a new body is like trying on a new suit of clothes off the rack which you want to buy and hope it won't need alterations time masters only once every few years does a time master in training come my way when i recognize one they are a resource to be treasured since there are other specialties associated with timelines I must guard against making early presumptions in the hypnosis session. For instance, the archivist souls assist souls in searching out their past histories and alternate timelines to those events. Thus, they function more as historians and chroniclers than as time masters, who would track timelines of the immediate future for bodies under consideration in the life selection room. As with the other soul specialties, I'm sure there is overlapping here, too, with many masters working on time coordination for souls in need of their services. This is why my clients... Yeah, I just saw that the audiobook was way too loud. I apologize. I'm going to redo that segment because it's going to annoy the shit out of people who watch the replay. So, yeah, it's not too bad. Just a minute. So hang in there with me just a minute, and we're going to redo the audio. Okay, I apologize. I don't know what the hell just happened with all this stuff. <laughs> Very strange. Okay. Okay, my friends. This should do it. Okay, going back in the chapter 9. A client said, for me, getting a new body is like trying on a new suit of clothes off the rack, which you want to buy and hope it won't need alterations. Time Masters Only once every few years does a Time Master in training come my way. When I recognize one, they are a resource to be treasured. Since there are other specialties associated with timelines, I must guard against making early presumptions in the hypnosis session. For instance, the archivist souls assist souls in searching out their past histories and alternate timelines to those events. Thus, they function more as historians and chroniclers than as time masters, who would track timelines of the immediate future for bodies under consideration in the life selection room. As with the other soul specialties, I'm sure there is overlapping here, too, with many masters working on time coordination for souls in need of their services. This is why my clients often lump them all together in their minds with the label of planners. There is much the time master trainees don't know yet, or so they say. As I probe the esoteric aspects of any soul specialty, there is the necessity of sorting out the usual blockages of details I am not supposed to know as opposed to what my advanced subject really doesn't know. Listeners may wonder why I didn't ask other relevant questions in the cases presented in this book. The chances are I did, but received no response. Chances are I did, but I received no response. Boy, isn't that the truth. Again, it's the blockade of information. You're only allowed so much. 
And don't even think about prying into my shit. See, that's the, that's the translation that I get with this stuff when I see these blockades. Sometimes, both the trainee in a specialty area and I bring forth information which starts off as being inadvertent and then snowballs. Such was the case with a soul called Abidam, who is an engineer in his current life. I will begin the dialogue at a memorable point in our session. Case 63 Dr. N. Obadom, can you tell me what you do between lives that represents your greatest challenge as a soul? Subject. I study time on the planet Earth. Dr. N. To what end? Subject. I wish to be a master of this art, traveling the timelines, understanding the sequences with people living in a physical world, to help the planners assist souls in their life selections. Dr. N. How is your program progressing? Subject. Size. Very slowly. I'm such a beginner, I need many mentors. Dr. N. Why were you chosen for this training? Subject. It is very difficult for me to tell you because I don't think I am very worthy of this art. I suppose it all began because I enjoy manipulating energy and became rather good at it in my classes. Dr. N. Well, isn't this true of many souls who make things by energy manipulation in their creation classes? Subject, beginning to warm to my questions. This is different. We don't create in the same way. Dr. N. What is different about your work? Subject, to work with time, you must learn spatial manipulation. You start with models and then go to the real thing. Dr. N. What sort of models? Subject. Dreamily. Oh. A huge vaporized pool of swirling liquid energy. Thinning in those gaps where scenes are simulated for us in many bites. The gaps open. You see neon tubes of fluctuating light. Ready for entry. Stops. It's really hard to explain. Dr. N. That's all right, Abidam. I would like to discuss where you are now working, who teaches you, and something about the practical art of becoming a time master. Subject. Quietly. Time training is conducted at a temple. Grins. We call it the Temple of Time, where teachers instruct us in the application of Energy sequences for events. Dr. N. What are sequences? Subject. Timelines exist as energy sequences of events which move. Dr. N. Tell me how you manipulate energy in the timelines. Subject. Time is manipulated by compressing and stretching energy particles within a unified field and to regulate its flow like playing with rubber bands. Dr. N. Can you change events in the past, present, and future? Is that what you mean by manipulation? Subject. Long pause. No, I can only monitor the energy sequences. We operate as highwaymen who enter and exit the sequences, which we consider roads, by speeding up and slowing down. Condensing our energy speeds us up and expansion slows us down. It's the same thing with events and people who appear on the sequences as points in the road. We don't create anything. We intersect as observers. Dr. N. Then who created the time sequences in the first place? Subject. Exasperated. How can I know that? At my stage, I am only trying to function within the system. Dr. N. Just asking, Abadam, you're being very helpful. Tell me, to what purpose do you function as a time master in training? Subject. We are given one event assignments. The human choices around that event all have meaning. The practical applications of what we do involve human streams of thought and actions that join in a river of time. Dr. N. I would call these... A Human thoughts and actions, you said, that can join in a river of time. 
See how time fucks us all up? Time is... Yes, it's an illusion. But it's an illusion that we still are experiencing as long as we're in this body. The practical applications of what we do involve human streams of thought and actions that join in a river of time. Dr. N., I would call these occurrences passages of action and memory of that action. Subject, I would agree. Particles of energy do involve memory. Dr. N., how? Subject, energy is the carrier of thought and memory within the sequences, and these never pass into oblivion. The conduit by which time is perceived begins with thought, the shaping of an idea, then the event, and finally the memory of the event. Dr. N., how is all this recorded into the sequences? Subject, by the vibrational tone of each recorded particle of energy. This is what we recover. Dr. N., can the sequences exist in all sorts of alternate realities? Subject, pause. Yes, overlapping and interlaced. This is what makes the search interesting if one has the skill to find them. Overlapping and interlaced. Energies colliding with one another. And, in my opinion, manipulating one another. And I just want to go quickly to the comment section because I think it's a really important thing that was pointed out. Uh, 432 Hertz says it's insightful that even in the spirit world, we are denied certain knowledge. Yes, yes. And it's overwhelmingly obvious that that is occurring and it is egregious shit. Very egregious. And, uh, again, like I like to put out these near-death experiences okay I, I bring them up all the time but near-death experiencers will say not everyone but a lot of them will say i was all knowing i had the answer to every question yada 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 but what when you're reading those listening watching whatever the case may be what you're gonna see is they are being fed information they are communicating with something and getting that information or tapping into something that is external to them. And then conveniently, they come back down here and they forget whatever the hell they were trying to do. Or, you know, and, and you know, people who have had near death experiences that may be listening to this channel just know that. My heart goes out to you. You know, I'm not shitting on you if you've had an experience like that and thought that you were all knowing and this and that. And, and a lot of people who have near-death experiences, they end up improving their lives so, so much, okay? So there's a lot, a lot of positive things that come out of a near-death experience as it pertains to your life when you come back, okay? And, and at the same time... A lot of times, at the same time, a lot of times, people who have near-death experiences have a rough couple years when they first get back. It's difficult, difficult time for them. But in the long run, most of the time, they're able to have a more fruitful life, a better life, a spiritual life. Oftentimes, they end up divorcing their husband or their wife. And a lot of things in their, you know, cascade off of all this stuff. And most like most of the time, it seems that they come out on the other end better for it. And their life specifically is better. OK, but if you listen to some of these near death experiences, they make you think that, uh, oh, my God, I was all knowing I had all this knowledge and, you know, I was sent the only reason i came back is because i'm on a mission i'm on a mission i have unfinished business yada yada etc etc you've heard it all before where they talk about these things and they're convinced into coming back here deceived into coming back here 
and then when they first get back here, what's the common thread in a near-death experience? One of the most tip-top common things you will hear a person who has a near-death experience say, I didn't want to come back. Pre-birth memories, what do they say? I didn't want to come back overwhelmingly i don't know what the percentage is but it's the high 90s got to be mid to high 90 percentile of people who have near-death experiences say they did not want to come back really really important stuff to to take into account when you're doing your own research into the matrix reincarnation soul trap as it pertains to near-death experiences and pre-birth memories really 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 important all things can be observed and retrieved for study. Dr. N. I need more direction here, Abidam. Subject. There's a lot I can't tell you. The particles of energy which are part of the causation for the setting up of events in time involve vibrational patterns with many alternatives. We view all this human history as useful for future incarnations of people. Dr. N. Tell me how you feel about alternate possibilities to events. Subject. Long pause. We study what is productive. Events, poor, better, best, are played out until they cease to be productive. Sighs deeply. Anyway, I'm still very new at that. And you got to ask yourself, who determines whether it's productive or not? You know, who determines that? Come on. Let's go. I study the past scenes of what has taken place. Dr. N. So are you saying everything that can exist in time does not necessarily exist if there is nothing for human beings to learn from its existence? Subject. Pause. Ah, yes. Similar situations of decision-making call for slightly different solutions. And after a while, the differences are so small they would be non-productive as lessons. Dr. N. From all you have told me, Abadam, I have the feeling you are not much engaged in future time just yet. So how do you see yourself? Subject. I think of myself more as an archaeologist in time. My assignments are studying people and events of the past and present. The future is murky. The sequence is unclear. The sequence is unclear because free will is involved. They have an idea. We have an idea as to how things are supposed to go when you make your life script prior to coming here or are deceived into a certain life script under the guise of uh, bullshit and fuckery of it being for your spiritual evolution. That could be the furthest thing from the truth. That's the excuse given for why you're here and why you chose the path that you chose. When you come here, you're battling free will all over the place. You know, your parents' free will, your grandparents' free will, your friends, your teachers, government. All these things. And you're just thrusted into this. So things are obviously not going to ever play out exactly how they were planned. But the point is, is you have that rough script that is designated to you, which you consent to. I consented to. Everybody consented to. And then you're just thrown to the wolves, basically. And depending on uh, where you popped out of and and uh, conditions surrounding you and, and all these, all, so many different factors is going to determine how your life path goes. No, I'm an archaeologist with time right now. Dr. N, where did your studies really begin in this field? Subject, when my class was assembled for training at the temple. Dr. N, how many souls are in your class? Subject. There are six of us. Pause. Adding. I didn't know anyone before we got there. Dr. N. Abadam, 
Tell me about your initial training. Certainly this must be clear in your mind. Subject. I was sent to the world of Galath. It is a physical world similar to the geography of Earth. This world once had a great civilization, highly technical, and the Galathians were able to travel to other planets, which led to their undoing. Galath now has no highly intelligent life forms. Dr. N., I don't understand why you were sent to a dead world. Subject. It is not dead so much as vacant. When we arrived for training, we assumed a transparent form which resembled the humanoid appearance of the old Galathians. Laughs. Dr. N. Tell me about them. Subject. (laughs) I was just thinking. They were yellowish-green people very tall and willowy, without apparent joints. They had large, multifaceted insect eyes. Dr. N., what were they like as a people? Subject, the Galathians were wise but foolish, like the rest of us. They came to believe in their invincibility. Dr. N., but what is the purpose of coming here? Isn't everything gone? Subject, Don't you see? Their timelines still exist. We are here to practice intersecting with the old history of this place. This is kind of an exotic world with beat-up space platforms still circling the planet. On the ground there are huge spheres of habitation which are now empty and falling apart. Plants growing in their ancient halls of learning. Decaying vestiges of this once great civilization are scattered about. Dr. N. Just what do you and your five classmates do, Abidam? Subject. We beam out our energy and float through the corridors of their past time. One of the teachers helps us adjust our vibrations to intersect with certain periods of Galathian history. Yeah, the teachers help. Isn't that nice? It is fragmentary because of our lack of skill. But certain scenes of... It is fragmentary because of our lack of skill. Again, know your role, get in line, and you're, you will only get what the Matrix deems you worthy of getting. Otherwise, you get in the corner with your dunce cap on, and you follow the rules. <laughs> Seriously. What the fuck? Helps us adjust our vibrations to intersect with certain periods of Galathian history. It is fragmentary because of our lack of skill. But certain scenes of their power are vivid. Dr. N. So nothing of the past is ever really lost? Subject. No. Although the Galathians are gone, everything they did, in a sense, still lives. Their triumphs. Their decline. We can study their mistakes. I can retrieve people talking at certain moments, what they were thinking before they were conquered by another race and assimilated into their culture away from here. The Galathians had a musical language which flows around their broken ships of space and deserted streets. Dr. N., what is your ultimate goal, Abaddon? Subject, when I become proficient... I will serve as an advisor for the planners who wish to design certain situations for people. Help the library researchers. Oh, design certain situations for people. Let's let's just tear that beauty again, just really quickly. Dr. N., what is your ultimate goal, Abaddon? Subject, when I become proficient, I will serve as an advisor for the planners who wish to design certain situations for people. Certain situations for people. And when I'm allowed to. When you're allowed to. Help the library researchers. Assist in coordinating selections in the sphere of life. Assist in the sphere of life. Assist. Yeah. That sounds that sounds noble. This this spirit deserves an award. Let's heist them up. Here, here. That is the ring. That sort of thing. Dr. N. Abaddon, I have a personal question for you. If I was a soul with some time off between lives, 
Could I come back to my hometown as it existed when I was a boy and see myself again with my family and friends in scenes from the past? I don't mean recreating all this in the spirit world, but actually coming back to Earth in a disembodied state, Ugh. as you did on Galath. Subject. Smiles. Sure. Although you might need some help with a talented teacher before you got the hang of it. Just don't expect to do any tinkering around with the original to make alterations. Sardonically. Remember, you would be a ghost. Free Will At one of my lectures in Vancouver, British Columbia, a distraught woman rose and cried out loudly, You New Age gurus tell us on one hand we have free will to make choices in our life and on the other that we are predestined to follow a certain plan because of past life karma. Which is it? I have no free will in my life because I am at the mercy of forces over which I have no control. My life is one of sorrow. After my talk, I sat down next to this woman for a few minutes and learned that her 19-year-old son had recently been killed on a motorcycle. All right, you know, this woman... Here we go. It's the voice of reason entering the conference room. And, you know, my heart goes out to her, just like I'm sure Dr. Newton's heart went out to her that she lost her son, her 19-year-old son. But here, these are the questions that Dr. Newton just excused away. Oh, no big deal. No big deal. Everything's fine. Everything's love and light. Everything's a learning experience. You're here to learn. It's a school. Everything is a learning experience. Blow it out your ass, Dr. Newton. Blow it out your ass. People have the idea that free will and destiny are opposing forces. They do not realize that destiny represents the sum of our deeds over thousands of years in a multitude of incarnations. Yeah, so it's the carryover of um, one bullshit to the next bullshit, and it just continues on until you figure out that it's all bullshit. Does that make sense? In all these lives, we had freedom of choice. Our current life represents all past experiences, both pleasant and unpleasant, and so we are the product of all our former choices. Add to this the fact that we may have deliberately placed ourselves in situations that test how we will react to events in our current life, which are not perceived by the conscious mind. This, too, involves personal choices. We occupy a particular body for many reasons. The young motorcycle rider, by his mother's own admission, lived for speed and essentially got a high from the dangers of his obsession. Because my last section on time opened the door to future probabilities and possibilities, it is appropriate to examine the ramifications of free will a little further. Reincarnation would mean nothing if all life was predetermined. In my remarks about timelines, I suggested that the future may exist in many realities. People who have premonitions about the future may be right or wrong. If someone saw themselves being killed in a certain place and time and it didn't happen, this potential causality could mean it was only the most dire of alternative possibilities. An argument for determinism, as opposed to free will, is that one source, or a collective group of lesser divinities, is responsible for planet Earth being populated with humans, who suffer from disease, pain, hunger, and fear. We live in a world of earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other natural disasters over which we have no control. And human fuckery. And just flat-out insanity. All right? Nature's just one little aspect to a system that is just filled with debauchery. Everywhere you turn. I have often said that Earth is considered by souls to be a very difficult school. The great lesson of Earth... It's not a school... It's not a fucking school. We're not going to take that bullshit. This channel doesn't do that. So if you want peace, love, light, rainbows, and unicorns, you're in the wrong channel. What we do here is we call out the bullshit for what it is. Earth 
is not a school. The only lesson you learn here is that you need to escape. That's the only lesson. Period. There's no other lesson that needs to be learned here than the fact that you fell into a deception. We consented to it. We fell for the bullshit. And we got to learn our way out. That's it. That's the only fucking lesson. Period. I guess you could say the other lesson is just learning how insane it is. But the only true lesson at the end of the day that one can take from here and actually use is that of liberation and sovereignty. Period. The end. That's it. Considered by souls to be a very difficult school. The great lesson of Earth is to overcome both planetary and private destructive forces in life, grow strong from the effort, and move on. To a great extent, we come equipped with what we need to take care of ourselves. Karma may at times seem punitive, but there is justice and balance which we may not recognize in our sorrow. Fear arises when we separate ourselves from our spiritual power. We knew many of the challenges in advance of our life and chose them for good reasons. Accidents involving our bodies are not considered to be accidental by the soul, as I have tried to show in many... Oh, the rage inside me that's burning. Let's rewind that just a little bit. Just a little bit. ...in our sorrow. Fear arises when we separate ourselves from our spiritual power. Okay. I, I will say that, yes, that fear does arise when we choose to let outside influences, influences come in and mess with us, screw with our psyche, our, our state, our day, our month, our year, our life... And choose to give them energy. To choose to point our energy in the direction of where fear is being projected onto us. Like through the media. Like through religion. Like through authority figures. Government. School. Teachers. All this stuff. Okay? All that is casted onto you as if it fucking means anything. As if it means a goddamn thing. It's all there to control you. Every last bit of it. And what does that do? You start to, to swim in that fear that is projected onto you. And it makes your life crappy at times. And, and for some people, it can make their entire life crappy. But you're so much better than that. That's why, like, when I... You know, talk to people who are worried about where the world's headed. Who gives a fuck? Who cares? Live in the now, my friends. Live in the now. This is the moment you have. This very moment where we're together talking about this stuff. And then the moment after this, when the stream ends, you have that uh, those other moments to live with. But don't let these assholes come in and scare the shit out of you. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. There's nothing you can do. The system and the parasites attached to the system are way, way more able to pull the strings than we are. But that doesn't mean we have to uh, coalesce with this bullshit. It doesn't mean we need to allow it to interfere with our everyday life. Fuck that. Take solace in knowing that you figured out the bullshit of this game. And I say game loosely, okay? Because it's, it's just, it's just, it's a parasite. That's what it is. It's a, it's a disgusting, vile parasite that has done this, okay? And we played our role. Let's not diminish that either. Because if, we're, if truth doesn't care about our feelings, my friends, it doesn't. The truth is the truth, and it um, doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive. Either way, if you desire truth and come from the heart where your sole objective is to find the truth, 
and learn the truth and discover it on your own, maybe with small channels like mine being a, a very, 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 very small stepping stone for your journey, then great. But all the answers are out there. Everyone can learn this. No, you know, again, I'm not here saying I have special information, this and that. Everyone has access to the same inf information I do. And I continually say that because it's really important that you know that, that I am not like some other channels out there who say, oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, channeling the Archerian Council. And yeah, we, we just had a really amazing meeting and they say, oh, we're, th they're on our side and they're going to fight for humanity. But just keep waiting. Kind of like all the people who wait for Jesus to come. It's the same fucking thing. It's no different. You waiting for aliens? What are you doing? You're waiting for aliens and giving energy to something exterior to you. Either way, boom, Matrix wins. You're hoping on Jesus coming and, and praying that Jesus is going to come and change things. Boom, what have you done? You've allowed something outside of you to continue to flourish. The Matrix loves it. The Matrix loves when you do that. The Matrix loves when we all fall for that type of shit outside of ourselves. It doesn't matter whether it's fear, spiritually driven, school, government. It doesn't matter what you pick the topic. If you feel uncomfortable from something projecting outside onto you in, in a moment, just collect yourself. Collect yourself and say, whoa, wait a minute. This isn't me. This is something outside of me trying to get me to feel a certain way. It doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. The point is, is something exterior to you is guiding you to a certain way of perception. And what happens when you're here? Everything is about perception management. That's what the system thrives off of, of molding and massaging your perception to feel, act, and do certain things like it wants you to do. Be a good little sheep. Get in line, be a good little sheep, and be afraid of everything. Well, let me tell you, that's no way to live. And when you can finally push past all that, shed all that bullshit, and start living in the moment, this very second, where we're all together, that's you living in the moment. Now, what if I say to you, oh, well, tomorrow, you know, um, uh, you know, aliens are going to come down in a UFO and, they're, you know, they're going to blow up the White House. Well... You know, then what are you going to do? You're going to start thinking, oh, my God, aliens are going to blow up the White House. And, uh, you know, then, you know, the government's not going to be there for me to keep me safe and keep me all nice, and warm and fuzzy. I mean, come on. Don't give in to exterior influences that want to mold your perception about who you are, what you are. And everything around you, you don't deserve that. You deserve to be happy. You deserve to live in, in, by your own compass, okay? By your own influence. But don't let those outside forces get you, my friends. Don't. It's the worst, worst place you can be in. You're so much better than that. All right, end of rant. We knew many of the challenges in advance of our life and chose them for good reasons. Accidents involving our bodies are not considered to be accidental by the soul, as I have tried to show in many cases, such as Case 62, with the woman from Amarillo who was shot to death. The sheer will of our true self has the power to rise in opposition to our weakness in character, especially during adversity. We have the freedom to remake our lives after any catastrophe if we are willing to take the responsibility to do so. More important than the events that test us in life is our reaction to these events and how we handle the consequences. 
This is the primary reason for conscious amnesia. I have indicated that the soul is not usually shown all the alternatives to probable future events in the life to come. There are good reasons for this practice, despite spontaneous spiritual memory recall, which exists with some people. Amnesia allows for free will and self-determination, without the constraints of unconscious flashback memory. I mean, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to try not to explode. <laughs> Let's just rewind this very briefly, and uh, re we'll rewind this insanity. <laughs> Christ. There are good reasons for this practice, despite spontaneous spiritual memory recall, which exists with some people. Amnesia allows for... Some people. Some people. Again... And not like you come down here with a guidebook and, you know, you're good to go. You know, oh, man, I picked the badass life script this time. I'm going to live it out to the fullest. Well, surprise, surprise. You're born here. You pop out of the womb. You're all upset, crying. You start living your life. And, you know, that life script uh, doesn't really pan out exactly as planned because of all the exterior influences that you're subjected to while you're here. And... Memory recall, which exists with some people. Amnesia allows for free will and self-determination. Oh, my God. Amnesia allows for self-determination... And free will. Knock, knock. Hello? Hello? I mean, really? Really, Dr. Newton? You're gonna... You're really gonna say that? It allows for free will because of amnesia? Are you fucking kidding me? Are you... F Can you really say that with a straight face? Like, if I met him and brought that up to him, he, he can actually say that with a straight face. <laughs> Holy shit. Practice. Despite spontaneous spiritual memory recall, which exists with some people, amnesia allows for free will and self-determination without the constraints of unconscious flashback memories about what we viewed in the screening room. While the scenes presented to us covering our next life are selective, my cases have shown we will be given the opportunity to review all the major alternatives after the life is over. Oh, we'll be able to be given uh, all the alternatives after the life is over. How sweet. A little fucking late for that, isn't it, Dr. Newton? Ring, ring. Hello. I mean... Are we in the fucking Twilight Zone here? I mean, I really feel like... <laughs> I feel like I, I love the Twilight Zone. Love it. Love uh, the spinoff show, too. What was it called? Uh, Night Gallery. Love those shows. But I swear to God, you combine all those fucking episodes, com and you plop them into one. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing compares to the existence when you're down here. Not a goddamn thing compares to what you step into in the clown show that ensues once you decide to take on the body. Holy shit. I have a short but very graphic example of free will that reveals how even discarnate souls can be surprised by a sudden decision which can change the probable outcome in life. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had a client who was killed at the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863 as a newly recruited Union soldier. His name was John, and he lived in a small community near Gettysburg. Although just sixteen, John and his sweetheart Rose had begun to talk of marriage in the future. The night before the three-day battle began, a Union officer rode into John's area looking for a young, non-combatant who could ride a horse well to deliver dispatches. John had no plans to enlist in the war because of his age and the fact he was needed on his mother's farm. The Union officer found John and hurriedly explained his urgency, promising that John's enlistment would end when the battle ended. 
John was a fine horseman, and he impulsively agreed to ride for the Union because I did not want to miss out on a chance for the grand adventure. He had to leave immediately without saying goodbye to anyone. John was killed the next day. Even as he floated above his body, John could not believe he was seeing himself lying on the ground dead. Upon returning to his spirit group, John was met by Rose, that portion of her essence she had not taken to earth. At the moment Rose saw John, she cried out, Why are you back here? We were supposed to be married. These soulmates quickly realized that John had abruptly chosen a path that deviated from his probable life. Even so, each path has karmic benefits of some sort. Each path has karmic benefits, and he chooses a different life path in the moment. But guess what? He doesn't even fucking know it. He doesn't know it. Do you know it? Do you have the do you have the um the guidebook that came with you when you got here? Do you have that nice little beautiful guidebook that says, "Okay, well, you know, this is your life path. This is your life script. You're supposed to kind of do this, you're supposed to do that because you got to clear up that karma. Clear up that karma. Clear it up. Don't get lost. You're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to be here for spiritual development. But yet you come here with zilch, nothing. And, you know, yeah, there are some exceptions of people who do retain some small fragments of memory here and there. But let's just cut to the chase and be honest with each other, my friends. The bulk of us don't have that. Don't have any clue. And even the ones that do, that I've uh, broken down with pre-birth memories on it. So only done, I think, one or two episodes on it on the, sh on the channel. But the point is, even the ones that do, they still get lost. And they and it doesn't necessarily mean that the that the life script that they life path that they chose is going to come at them at an opportune moment. It could come many years down the road, it could come early on in life, and then you lose it, and it means absolutely nothing because of the transference of your state of mind. Again, until the age of six or seven, you're borderline in a theta state, a sponge for your surroundings. Your surroundings are what dictate a good portion of how you will be the rest of your life. That's why there's that famous Jesuit quote. Give me the boy until the age of seven and I'll show you the man. They know. They don't say that shit just pulling it out of their ass. They say it because they know. They know. They know the importance of getting to us when we're young. Doesn't matter what, you know. If I can get to you as a child... I'm most likely going to be able to mold your reality, your future reality, as long as I can sneak and weasel my way in there at a young age. That's how sick and twisted this system is. That's how sick and twisted this all is. And we're at a disadvantage immediately coming out of the womb. Hands down. You don't have any advantage when you get here. None. The only advantage that you may have is if you are born into a family that is quote-unquote awake. And even then, there's different levels of being awake. I mean, how rare is it that someone is born into a family that actually has even a remote clue of what the hell is going on here? Okay, well, let's move on. As was the case with John's brief army experience. I asked this client if he had been shown scenes in the screening room of what was going to happen at Gettysburg. He replied, No, I accepted what they showed me up to the age of 16 because I knew they had good reasons to reveal only what I needed to know before that life. I have faith in the decisions of my guides. John, the boy soldier, was not shown the possibility of his death at Gettysburg, and this is very typical with such cases. Yet what about those cases where an untimely death is such a high probability in life 
that there is a necessity for the planners to give us the opportunity to volunteer for these bodies as a matter of personal benefit from the experience. Yeah, I know past-life regressionists who have had numerous cases of heroic souls who volunteered to participate in the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. Oh. I certainly have. Perhaps this is because so many of these souls from the death camps are now living new lives in America. There are options for all kinds of disasters. For the bad ones, sometimes souls are prepared for what lies ahead for them by attending pre-life rehearsals, as illustrated by this statement from a client. I remember passing by a large group... Step right up. We want you to uh, be involved with the concentration camps. Come on. Oh, can you imagine being weaseled into something like that? Oh, the, uh, or just any, I mean, seriously, being born into any country or any situation where war is on the horizon or where war is already ongoing or who knows, you pick the nightmare scenario that could potentially be involved with picking out a life. Boy, <clears throat> there aren't many places to incarnate on earth where you're not going to run into some bullshit. Crazy. Souls in a preparation class who were gathered in an amphitheater structure. They were all listening to a speaker tell them about the value of life, even though they were only going to Earth for a short time. They had all volunteered to be in some sort of disaster where they would be killed together. They were told to get mentally prepared and to make the most out of the time they had and that if they wished, their next lives could be much longer. Case 64 This is a case of euthanasia involving a subject named Sandy. She provided me with another example of an instance where a death scene was shown to the principles of a future life. As is so often true with souls who must witness their death in advance of a new life, volunteering is part of the contract. During my intake interview, I learned that Sandy was closely bonded to her brother, Keith, and that they were members of a large family. As his older sister, she had taken care of him like a mother while they were growing up. Keith was hot-headed, and in his teenage years he lived on the ragged edge, driving fast cars and getting into numerous scrapes with the law. Sandy told me Keith lived as though he had a death wish. She added that Keith had hurt some people along the way with Breaking the law, breaking the law. Having fast cars and getting into numerous scrapes with the law. Sandy told me Keith lived as though he had a death wish. She added that Keith had hurt some people along the way with a capricious lifestyle. But he had a good heart, and his zest for living each day to its fullest was contagious. Sandy always had a premonition her brother would die young. Keith was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, at age 27, and died two years later. That sounds great. Sounds like a perfect life script to pick out. Ugh. Just the mere thought that I may have picked Lyme disease in my life script is just... The thought of it is just appalling. I mean, imagine ALS. Ugh, that's so horrible. Horrible. What a way to go out. Ugh. ALS is a degenerative disease of motor movements that progresses into muscle atrophy within a couple of years. Toward the end, many patients must be on a respirator to breathe, and they receive large doses of morphine to combat agonizing pain. When Sandy reached her spirit group during our session, we discovered brother and sister were companion souls. Keith was the fun-loving prankster in their group, and over many previous centuries he had been rather careless of others' feelings. In consultations with his guide and members of the group, Keith recognized it was essential that he learn humility in order to advance. Being a soul of temerity, Keith asked for a life where he would be given a potent challenge toward acquiring humility, rather than have this lesson strung out over many lives. He was warned that accelerated lives can be very rough. Keith said he was ready. It was a bitter pill in the ring to discover he would have to volunteer for an athletic body 
which would be immobilized by ALS. Sandy said that there was a point in the life selection room where her brother almost backed out. I will pick up her narrative at this place in our session. Dr. N. This is... Almost backed out. Almost backed out. I mean, really, that, that says a lot right there, that it's there was some trepidation there going on. And, well, ugh, crazy, crazy stuff, man. Crazy stuff. Or brothers and sisters, I should say. All right, I'm just going to rewind. I accidentally skipped past this by accident. That's cute. Almost backed out. I will pick up her narrative at this place in our session. Dr. N. Please tell me as much as you can about Keith's reaction to the body he was offered. Subject. Solemnly. He was shown the worst. His body before and after the illness struck. How his independence would be taken away to make him dependent upon us. They kept nothing from him. Keith saw in the beginning of the disease there would be much self-pity and remorse, then terrible anger. But if he fought, he would learn. Dr. N., switching back and forth from... But he thought he would learn. Oh, God. This poor guy. Oh. Disease, there would be much self-pity and remorse, then terrible anger. But if he fought, he would learn. Dr. N., Ugh. Switching back and forth from current time to the spirit world with Sandy. And did he learn? Subject. Oh, yes. Near the end, Keith grew calm. Accepting and appreciative of what we did for him. Accepting and appreciative of what we did for him. Oh, my God. I swear to God, you listen to this stuff again. It's like you're in the twilight zone. Imagine picking ALS in your life script. Oh, my Lord. Nightmare. Dr. N, do you have anything you would like to explain about how Keith prepared for this life with you? Subject. Big lesson. After a long pause, my client's face takes on a look of acquiescence. I will tell you. It will be good to talk about this. I have told no one before. Begins to cry, and I work on keeping her in focus. Poor thing. Dr. N. We don't have to do this if it is too painful. Subject. No, I want to. Takes a deep breath. As we prepared to come forward into this life, I was to be the oldest child in our family, so I came first. We had a long discussion just before my time. Keith said he was prepared to suffer, but when he reached the point where he was totally incapacitated, when he couldn't take any more, I was to shut off his life support system and free him. Dr. N., you were going to do this in a hospital? Subject. We planned for that in the spirit world, but then, thank God, he was sent home during his last seven weeks, and that made our plan easier. Dr. N., is this about pain? Certainly Keith must have had painkillers. Subject. Morphine can only do so much. The last seven weeks were terrible, even with the respirator and painkillers. His lungs were so affected, he could not move or talk near the end. What a nightmare. I mean, really, to think... Like, I talked to my mom about this stuff, and I'm trying, like, hell to win her over and and present this and she's somewhat understandable to this stuff but at the same time it's like she can't fathom that we possibly chose this that we consented to this no matter how many examples i might be able to present it's just very difficult for her to see that and it's not even see it, it's an acceptance, because that's really the bottom line, is you come to a point where you see so many examples, uh, you know, you don't want to accept it, you don't want to acknowledge it, but that's where it leads, right? I mean, we again, the truth doesn't care about our feelings, right? It's 
It's the hard truth with this reality and everything that comes with it, including the body. Dr. N, I understand. Tell me about the plan you and Keith devised in the spirit world before your lives began. Subject, size. We began our drill by creating a bed and the life support system Keith saw in the screening room. He had every detail in his mind. Then we practiced because I thought I would be dodging doctors and nurses. I worked with the machine and studied the advance warning signs of his illness. In the drill, we went over the signals Keith would give me, which would show me he was ready to be released from his suffering. Finally, he asked for my promise to stay strong and let nothing deter me in the final moments. I gave him this promise willingly. After Sandy regained full consciousness, we discussed her role in the death of her brother. She said when there was a particular smell or death odor from Keith's throat area, she knew it was time to get ready. I should add that this body sign did not necessarily mean Keith was going to die right away. Almost without thinking, Sandy spoke in her brother's ear. Keith, are you ready to go? Then came the prearranged signal. At this moment, Keith squeezed his eyes open and shut three times for the yes response. The prearranged signal. Again, interesting wordage we're hearing. Prearranged signal. Hmm. Calmly, she detached Keith's life support system. The doctor came to the house later, found the life support system reattached, and pronounced Keith dead. For the rest of the day, she felt no guilt. That night, lying in bed, a doubt crept into Sandy's mind about her automatic reactions, and she questioned herself. After tossing and turning, she finally fell into a fitful sleep. Soon Keith came to her in a dream. Smiling with gratitude, he conveyed to Sandy that she had done everything perfectly and that he loved her. A few weeks later, Sandy was meditating and had a vision of her brother sitting on a bench talking with two monks dressed in robes. Two envisioned two monks sitting with robes. And what do we see all the time are these entities with robes playing a uh, master, guru, wannabe, bullshit, scam artist. Well, actually, I'm sorry, not wannabe. Playing scam artist, deceiver, manipulator across the board. Sick stuff. Really sick. Keith turned, laughed at her, and said, Hang in there, sis. Hang in there. To a devout religionist, this man's life did not belong to himself, but to God. While it is true that we are given our bodies by an act of... Didn't belong to himself, but God. Didn't belong to himself, but God. I mean, how much more proof do we need to keep th laying out there? I mean, it's right in our face, my friends. You don't have the ability to be free and sovereign. Because the system is a parasite that aims to take as much from you as possible and then spit you out on the other side and make you go through this all over again. Can you imagine? I can't even imagine. We're living it. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. It's just, this is how intricate the system is. I mean, readily admitting that, you know, you're giving yourself to God. Who is this God? Ask the question. I mean, you know, God is just thrown around like it's, you know, oh, it's this, it's that, you know. Oh, no big deal. You know, no, let's not question anything. God forbid that we question something and say that, oh, maybe this isn't an actual real creator, even though we're a piece of it. Again, I will say till the day I die that the the creator just creates. The creator doesn't want to be worshipped. We're a piece of that creator. We came from there. But the creator doesn't need worship. 
because the creator just creates. That much is very, very clear. Everything else that we're told as it pertains to, quote-unquote, God, is complete bullshit. If God is all-loving, all-knowing, all-compassionate, all-empathetic, this and that, then why does this world just keep to continue to function the way it is? Yes, we consent to it, but it doesn't... What I'm trying to say here, and this is really important, is that how we look at God as the mainstream narrative. All-knowing, all-loving, all-compassionate, all-empathetic, just, just, just a wonderful, wonderful being. But yet, here we are in this realm. We have a historic narrative to prove that things have always been this way. There's nothing to point to the opposite. Nothing. Yes, history may be packed with loads of lies, but as far as the God part of things go, God, as I interpret it, is a creator. It just continues to create. It doesn't meddle in and mess with us, okay? It gave us a, the, a divine feature, each and every one of us, and that's our ability to consent and utilize our free will. But, this is the big but, consent, as it pertains to outside forces, mixing in with our life force, does not need to be achieved fairly. It doesn't have to be moral. It doesn't have to be ethical. Just as long as you're giving consent, that's all the system cares about. And if it gets throw on some energy and blast it up your head and say, oh, well, I'm God. I'm all powerful. I'm all knowing. I'm just, uh, it's, you know, everything's a learning experience. Everything's a love, light, rainbows, and unicorns. Come on. Use your common sense. That's what I get. This is where common sense, critical thinking comes into play, and you ask yourself, hey, well, what am I living day to day? What's around me day to day? What's this realm about day to day? All the injustices, all the atrocities, all the bullshit, all the, all the constant pounding trying to take away your sovereignty every step of the way, everywhere you look, your sovereignty is trying to be just yanked from you every which way possible. And yet, oh... God is all loving, all knowing, all beautiful, and he and you know Jesus is going to come back, and everything's going to be amazing. Come on, how can you deny the realities of the world and the historic narrative that we can look at and say, "Hey, you know, we get this one story, but then when we're looking on the other end, mm, doesn't quite match up." See what I'm saying? That's how you know. It's, it's one example of many about how you can know within yourself that we're being peddled a bunch of bullshit. It's really, really important to, to know this because we've just been given a bill of goods and we went along with it. But no more. No more. All right, that's my rant on that one. Oof. That a vision of her brother sitting on a bench talking with two monks dressed in robes. Keith turned, laughed at her, and said, Hang in there, sis. To a devout religionist, this man's life did not belong to himself, but to God. While it is true that we are given our bodies by an act of divine creation, belong to God. everyone's life belongs ultimately to them. The oh, boy, isn't, isn't that just... Uh contradiction and a half let's just rewind that just a little bit i'm sorry but it's really this is really really important turned laughed at her and said hang in there sis to a devout religionist this man's life did not belong to himself but to god didn't belong to himself but to god devout religionist okay that's because what what happens they were fed that information growing up became used to it, 
The propaganda was laid on thick, and it worked. While it is true that we are given our bodies by an act of divine creation, everyone's life belongs ultimately to them. The right ultimately to them. But yet all these motherfuckers in the astral realm, down here, everywhere you turn, all they're trying to do is just take from you. Take, 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 take. Give me your sovereignty. You don't deserve it. You don't deserve this information. You don't deserve that. Know your role. Step in line. And follow orders. That's, that's the interpretation that you get throughout this entire series. Is that you're not worthy. I mean, you know, let's just call it what it is. Again, we're not going to beat around the bush and try and make everybody feel good. I'm not here to win people over. I'm not here to win subscribers and all this other stuff. I don't care. The only reason I'm here is to connect with the people who question things, can be rational and not driven by propaganda, and can see these things on their own. Again, my channel should only be a stepping stone, a very, very, very small stepping stone for you to prove this to yourself. That's all that matters because I can scream and go crazy and, and disseminate all this information till the cows come home. But until you know it within your, deep within you, that all this is happening, it really makes no difference. But you got to put in the effort. You got to put in the time to, to figure this out for yourself because it's all there. Again, I have no access to special information. I don't have super secret space force sources. You know... Uh, 20 and back. 20 and back, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Sorry. To die is a hotly debated topic in legal circles today, especially as it pertains to doctor-assisted suicide with the terminally ill. It has been said that if death is the final act of life's drama, and we want that last act to reflect our own convictions during life, we should have that right, regardless of the religious or moral convictions of a majority. Uh, no shit. I mean, someone who suffers has a, a, a horrible disease, a horrible di terminal diagnosis. The fact that everyone doesn't have the, you know, a, a peaceful way to leave if they want is absolutely disgusting and a violation of your rights, a violation of common fucking decency. Some of the people I've seen suffer in my life, it's appalling. Appalling. They shouldn't have had to go through that. And yet this beauty of a system that we live in around the world can't allow you to, to, to leave with decency the way you want and not have to suffer and be through pain anymore. Come on. Absolutely disgraceful. Again, the atrocities of this shithole is what drives me and makes me angry and makes me present the way I do. It's the atrocities. It, that's what drives me. It infuriates me. Where is the common decency among humanity? Come on. The opposing view is that if life is a gift, of which we are the custodians, gift. we have certain moral duties, or despite our own feelings. <laughs> Knowing what I do about how our souls choose life, with the free will to make changes during that life, I believe we clearly have the right to choose death, when no quality of life remains and there is no possibility of recovery. Oh, shit. It is not intended that a degradation of our humanity be prolonged. The next case provides a more conventional representation of free will in terms of a full life. Case 65 Emily was a woman in her late 40s who came to see me because she was troubled by her purpose in life. During the years she was raising her children, Emily worked as a part-time secretary. Dissatisfied with this role, she returned to school and qualified as a nurse with an interest in geriatrics. During training, she discovered she liked treating the elderly 
because they were more inclined to talk about their faith. Emily had been attracted to spirituality all her life. She told me that her upbringing by a strict, rather cruel, and overly pious father had turned her toward less structured avenues of spirituality. Although she had become a registered nurse some two years before our meeting, Emily had not worked in her new profession because of self-doubts about her competence. Due to her happy marriage with a supportive husband, it had been easy just to slip into volunteer work without pay, pressure, or responsibility. As I moved Emily rapidly through her most immediate past life in the early stages of our session, we discovered her name had been Sister Grace, a nun for the Sisters of Mercy in New England. The Order wanted her to accept the position of Mother Superior, but she refused due to her fears of leadership and feelings of unworthiness. Indeed, a later overview from the spirit world of Emily's other recent past lives attested to a pattern of lives as priests and nuns in cloistered environments. She remarked, I was able to serve God without getting too involved with the troubles of outside society. I am often asked if the planners force certain lives on us for particular reasons. This case is a good example of just how indulgent our guides can be until we are finally ready for greater challenges. In the past 500 years, all of Emily's lives had been in religious orders in one form or another. She was comfortable with these lives and unwilling to make major changes. This past behavior represents a defining element of her confusion about life today. The dialogue for this case opens at the second council meeting after Emily's life as Sister Grace. You know, you know what? I'm pretty fucking confused, too. I have an idea what's going on, but yeah, it's, it makes sense that, you know, you're, you're confused. Ugh. Which means she was in preparation for her current life. If I discover there is to be a second council meeting between lives, it will usually take place just before we go to the ring, and I know the life to come is likely to involve an opportunity for significant change. Both the type and number of elders who appear at these second meetings depend on the kinds of lives and bodies to be presented. Dr. N., when you are at this second council meeting, is the makeup of the panel the same as the first one? Subject. No, only two appear. My chairperson and a member who seems to have taken a special interest in what I will be offered in the next life. Someone who takes a special interest in what you're going to be offered in the next life. Again, outside forces butting their way into your life, into your true essence, and saying, okay, well, you know, uh, you know, maybe being uh, wheelchair-bound... And uh, deformed is uh, the the way you want to live your life because you know you got to grow. It's all about spiritual growth. And you, and you remember that karma from last lifetime? Oh boy, you really messed up that time. So let's plop you in a wheelchair, give you some deformities, and uh, yeah, good luck. Next, Doctor N. Well, since we have already talked about your first council meeting, following the life of Sister Grace, just give me a sense of what is now going on before you go to the place of life selection. Subject. They want to know if I have thought long and hard about being in such a rut over the last 500 years, and if I am ready to get involved with mainstream society. Dr. N., would they be upset with you if you returned to a religious life once again? Subject, no, they are too wise for this sort of thing. They would just know I wasn't ready for a new undertaking yet. They are very gentle with me. I am reminded that my self-discipline and faith are to be admired, and I learned a great deal, but that too much repetition over many lives can hold me back. Yeah, you know, yeah, you're held back. Too much repetition, fall in line. You're not ready yet. You're not ready yet. You hear this stuff? I mean, it's all in our face. It's all right there. Easy to decode. Doesn't take much. The problem is with someone like Michael Newton and all these other New Age freaks, they like to put out these narratives of it being a learning experience. Or it's a school. 
You're supposed to spiritually evolve. Yada, 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 yada. Come on. Subject. No, they are too wise for this sort of thing. Too wise. Way they too They would wise. just know I wasn't ready for a new undertaking yet. They, they just know that you're not ready. They just know. They are very gentle with me. Very gentle. I am reminded that my self-discipline and faith are to be admired, and I learned a great deal, but that too much repetition over many lives can hold me back. Too much. Dr. Too N. Much. It's going to hold you back. Did you take lots of risks before the last 500 years? Before all those religious lives? God, Subject. Know. Laughs. I had been on a different path for a long time. I was excessive. Let's say celibacy was not on my agenda. Dr. N. So, after being Sister Grace, it was time to bring the next series of life choices back to some sort of center, to bring balance into your existence on Earth? Subject. Yes. And I tell them I am ready for a change. Note. Ready. My use of time shifts at council meetings was discussed in Chapter 6. With this case... I now shift forward to scenes in the life selection room to obtain a better therapeutic framework to help Emily. What follows is a portion of the cognitive reframing I used, which began with the venting and identification of personal conflicts. It is my intention that this hypnosis subject will recognize the opportunity her spiritual planners have given her to move forward into new ventures with greater self-awareness. Dr. N., we are now in the place where you are reviewing your current body as Emily for the first time. Are you alone or with someone? Subject. That second council member is with me, and I feel the presence of another who I can't see. Probably a coordinating time master. Dr. N. After briefly discussing other body choices, why are you attracted to the body of Emily? Subject. I go inside a screen to feel the wavelengths of this brain and how our mutual vibrations will blend. Our mutual vibrations would blend. Our mutual vibrations. What does that imply, my friends? It implies, again, something exterior, you know, sniffing around like a little rat, mixing its... Mixing itself all up in you. No thank you. We'll pass on that. It is a good meld between us. Her talents and sensitivity are very compatible with me. Dr. N. Reinforcement. Reinforcement. So you can see the planners have your best interests at heart. The planners have your best interests at heart. Again, where's your sovereignty in this mix? Ah, giving it away. Subject. Oh, yes. Dr. N. What do you see as the most significant aspect of your future life as Emily? Subject. Long pause. This is hard for me to answer. Very hard. I see her conflicts. They are my own. Being torn between doing one thing and wanting another kind of career. I do not see myself as a nurse. Dr. N., since you are qualified now to be a nurse, could it be that you are shown more, but at this moment your spiritual memory of these details is not revealed because the planners don't want to interfere with your free will to make a decision at such an important crossroad? Oh, I mean, seriously, give me the puke bucket. I mean, really? Are you kidding me? They don't want to interfere. That's all they do. Has this, I mean, this series has shown that. The previous series I did on Journey of Souls has shown that. And any other past life regression cases that we have access to that are not Michael Newton show nothing but interference. Nonstop. Endless. Subject. Maybe. I'm not sure. Pause. Ah. We don't have to be shown occupations. One can see moods, attitudes, and feelings at different times in the sphere of life with a particular body. Dr. N. Good. 
I want you to ride with those feelings about this body you occupy and tell me how you can thrive as a person. Subject. Another long pause. By nurturing people. Dr. N. Another long pause. Answer is, by nurturing people. Makes you wonder, was that an organic thought? Every time we have long pauses or defensive responses, it seems like they are consulting some outside force which provides them the answer that the system wants. Just saying. I can't say for certain that that's what's going on here, but... That's my suspicion. And what does that tell you? Subject. Thinking, but no response. Dr. N. Uh, And in the sphere of life selection, do you think the insight you now have about Emily is sufficient for you to accept this person and move forward to make a contribution in life? Subject. Yes. Yes. At this juncture in our session, Emily realized that there were elements of synchronicity in reviewing these past events in the ring with me at this time and having free will to change her life. Some trips to the ring give us more detail about a future life than others. Emily saw it was no accident she was assigned to an overly strict religious household as a child, which would drive her away from old conditioned behavior patterns into new paths of thought. She saw that her freedom to make new choices and rely on her gut feelings, gave her permission to undertake the search. Uncertainty in life is frequently an outgrowth of former life patterns and obsessions. Emily's old inner fear of not wanting to accept responsible positions within the church because she felt unworthy surfaced again in her current professional life. Because she felt unworthy. Because she felt unworthy. Just, you know... I'll throw that out there. Emily's old inner fear of not wanting to accept responsible positions within the church because she felt unworthy surfaced again in her current professional life. While the door was opening to her in the field of medicine in a profound way, it also left her confused. Why did it seem both right and wrong at the same time? Why did it feel right and wrong at the same time? Because she's being messed with. Emily had become mired in her plans for a midlife course correction over unconscious self-doubts which had peaked in her last life as Sister Grace. Within six months of our meeting, I received a letter from Emily explaining that she had taken a job with a nursing home and loved it. This particular facility wanted nurses who would not shy away from spiritual counseling to assist patients in dealing with feelings of helplessness, loneliness, and depression. Emily wrote that she felt spiritually fulfilled. I don't deserve much credit for shedding light on this situation because Emily had already started on her quest before our session. She, I mean, helping others feels good, right? I mean, that's like one of the better human qualities that we have. And it feels good when you can help others. It feels good when you can go out and and do the small acts of kindness. But when you have what's going on here, it just sucks. It sucks. Poor Emily. Just needed a nudge to keep going. Needed a nudge. Today, nearing age 50, she has broken free. This case is not presented to denigrate traditional religion or religious orders, by implying that Emily's soul had somehow wasted 500 years of incarnation time by taking roles of priests and nuns. Those were beneficial years of acting on her spiritual calling. Today, those same callings are satisfied on a different road. Change is a hallmark of karma through the use of free will in making course corrections into unfamiliar waters. Searching for who you really are is getting in touch with your inner self and bringing passion and meaning into what you do in life. Souls of the Young The Loss of a Child The ring represents a cycle of life, death, and rebirth. For the soul, children play a vital role in their regeneration of life. 
What are the spiritual implications when this highly functional organism dies before it hardly got started? There have been grieving parents who have written me inquiring about the meanings surrounding the untimely death of their children, and these letters are always difficult to answer. Those of us who have not gone through the agony of losing a child can only imagine the pain suffered by these parents. Some people who lose a child jump to the wrong conclusion that their terrible loss is the result of a karmic debt they must pay because of some transgression in a former life involving child abuse. If the lost child was a teenager or older, the karmic forces that led to the death customarily relate directly to the young person and not so much to the parent. Moreover, even when the death of a younger child does karmically involve the parent, this lesson does not automatically mean the parent was a perpetrator of mistreatment to children in a former life. The lesson could have been the result of many other elements, including that of indirect action. One of my clients who came to me about a year after the death of her eight-year-old daughter related the following story to me during her session. I was a wealthy matron in London in the 19th century. I paid little attention to the suffering of the young waifs on the street around my townhouse. I callously disregarded their plight because they were not my children. To my mind, they were the responsibility of their parents or the state and had nothing to do with me. I looked the other way, even though I had plenty of money to support an orphanage and a safe house for young unwed mothers nearby. I knew these services were struggling to make ends meet, and I did nothing. Between lives, I decided to correct my superficial ways. I agreed to experience the anguish of loving my own child and having her taken away. God, what pain! But I am learning compassion. Information about the soul and infant mortality has come to me over many years, which may provide some solace to mothers who feel remorse over both voluntary and involuntary actions involving the loss of an unborn child. This would include both issues of abortion and miscarriages. Please keep in mind during my review of this material that the karmic cause and effect relating to earlier past life incidents are particular to each parent-child relationship. My intent is to give the listeners some general interpretations about the young that I have acquired from the reports of many subjects. I will begin by stating that I have never had a single case where a soul joined the fetus in the first trimester. The reason that souls do not begin their complex merger with a fetus under three months is quite simply because there is not enough brain tissue for them to work with at this stage. I have a dear friend who is an obstetric nurse at a major hospital in Oregon. When she heard me make this statement on a national radio show, she called to say, Michael, why won't you let these little ones have their souls? She was clearly upset with me over the question of who does and who does not have a soul in place if a baby is not going to term. I began by saying something to the effect that I don't make the rules, so please don't kill the messenger. I suspect this caregiver of babies, who has seen many who did not survive and leave her hospital, felt that from the moment of conception, a fetus with a soul identity would somehow receive more spiritual comforting than otherwise. I told my friend, there is a universal consciousness of love surrounding all unborn babies. The creator... Universal consciousness of love that surrounds all babies. I remember, everything's love. Love, light, rainbows and unicorns, pixie dust, all this stuff. That's how this world works. And to think otherwise, oh my lord, that'd be blasphemy. Blasphemy that you actually call out this world for what it is. Come on. Let's get real here. Somehow receive more spiritual comforting than otherwise. I told my friend, there is a universal consciousness of love surrounding all unborn babies. The creative force of existence is never separated from any form of living energy. A fetus can be alive as an individual entity without yet having an immortal soul identity. If a mother aborts her child in the first trimester, there are loving spiritual forces hovering nearby to comfort this mother and watch over the child. 
I have been told that even in cases of miscarriages and abortions between four and nine months, souls can be in place to support both the child and mother in a more direct physical manner with energy. Souls know in advance the probabilities of the baby going to term. For example, if a pregnant woman loses her child because she fell down a stairway, say in the seventh month, it was not absolutely preordained she would take this fall. There was also the possibility on that particular day, at a certain moment in time, she might have decided at the last minute not to descend the stairway. However, if a young, unmarried girl becomes pregnant and decides to abort her child because it is unwanted, the chances are high this was a significant probable event of choices. These two interpretations of causality are, of course, hypothetical. Nevertheless, various scenarios of significant events in our life are known in advance when we choose certain bodies in the ring. All have karmic implications and purpose for us. Souls are not assigned to babies. All have karmic implications. Yeah, I'll translate that for you guys. Um, I'll have uh, bullshit implications. And, um, you know, you, you fall for this stuff and, and make yourself, you know, look, my heart goes out to anyone who lost a child. Doesn't matter whether it was while well, it was in development or, you know, in the pregnancy uh, phases, months, or later on in life. I mean, that's to me is um it's so heartbreaking and to think that to think that that can even remotely be planned and hooked into this karma system the the never-ending guilt trip is just sad it's really really sad so again we're talking about the injustices the atrocities everything that comes along with this realm that everybody just seems to shake off i mean i i swear to god i, I say this all the time it's it, this realm is like a never-ending guilt trip, never-ending trauma, and it's just sick. It's absolutely sick. But we also really have to come to grips with the fact of the role that we played in this. It doesn't mean that it was fair. Again, the consent that we give to engage with the system does not need to be achieved fairly, morally, ethically. None of it. Just as long as it's given. But that doesn't excuse it away either. Just because we played some role, but we were manipulated and deceived along with it? No, 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 no. No. We talk about what's right and what's wrong, and we call it out for what it is, and don't discount the fuckery involved other than, other than that one who chooses to just you know explain away everything oh it's god's plan it's karma it's this it's that i mean you pick the excuse humanity will come up with it and just be ah, ah, la, la, you know my head's in the clouds no big deal you know oh well you know that's god's plan okay all right sure all right you want to believe that, that's fine. But you're not going to evolve on a personal level on any way to help yourself if that's how you think things go. Dogma, certain ideologies are extremely toxic to your own inner development. You really got to... This is We have so much more control than we think, but part of that controls... Part of regaining that control, I should say, is based on stepping up to the plate and realizing what this realm is all about and saying, okay, I'm going to call it out 
I'm not going to excuse away this, excuse away that. Yes, I consented. I reluctantly accept it. Again, that's a hard phase to get through. And my heart goes out to anyone out there who is at that phase um, where they, they know the trap is happening. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's a difficult uh, process to come to that point. It's very, very hard. And even I, I even still grapple with it. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. That's why I, you know, again, I'm so, I'm fired up with this type of stuff because I'm sick of it. And I'm so sick of just everyone making excuses. To me, that's like the most insane part of all of this is how we're just around this confirmation bias machine every day all day our entire lives and uh you know yeah well that's god's plan that's our life script everything's normal you, you pick the whatever extreme side you want to go on but at the end of the day you know what they all funnel together into this big machine of fuckery that just excuses everything away and i won't have anything to do with it I don't care if I have one person listening or 500 people listening. I'm not going to excuse away this bullshit. I'm not. Because I feel like I'm living in a, in a realm just of pure insanity. Where everyone just excuses all these atrocities away as if it's, you know, oh, it's normal. Everything's fine. You know, it's just the way, it, you know, not much I can do. It's just the way it is. Well, no more. No fucking more. And excuse my language and, and anger and hostility with this stuff, but I am so, so sick and tired of the confirmation bias and just, you know, excusing away of everything. Some of the emails, you should see some of the emails I received. Well, uh, I'm not even going to get into it. Let's just keep going. Alive are known in advance when we choose certain bodies in the ring. All have karmic implications and purpose for us. Souls are not assigned to babies at random. When a mother loses her child for whatever reason, I have found the odds are quite high that the soul of this baby will return again to the same mother with her next child. If this mother does not bear another child, the soul may return to another close member of the family, because that was the original intent. When a life is short, Souls call these filler lives, and they too have purpose for the parent. Here is an illustration. I joined a fetus at four months for a three-month existence. During this time, my mother needed to feel my soul energy, to know that giving and losing life is very profound. I did not wish to let the sadness of losing me prevent her from having the courage to try again. We knew this fetus was not going to term but there was a good probability of a second child after me, and I wanted that partnership with her. She doesn't realize that I was once her son, and now I am her daughter. I think I was able to soften her bitterness and grief by sending my mother comforting thoughts in the stillness of all the nights between her two pregnancies. As I mentioned in the section on soulmates in Chapter 7, when babies and young children die... Their souls typically do not rise into the spirit world alone. Spirit guides, caretakers of the young, or a member of the child's soul group are frequently involved with meeting these souls right at ground level. If a parent is killed at the same time as their small child, they stay together, as the following quote demonstrates. After my son and I were killed by bandits, Sweden, 1842, I comforted him as we rose together. Because he was so young, he was disoriented and confused at first. I held my son close and told him how much I loved him and that we were going home. As we rose together, I said that we would soon be met by our friends and then parted for a while before being reunited once again. New Body Soul Partnerships The process... All right, let's uh, just rewind that one segment because it's really important to... Uh, decode the fuckery in that segment. 
very quickly. Because he was so young, he was disoriented and confused at first. I held my son close and told him how much I loved him and that we were going home. As we rose together... We were going home. You know what that translates to? We're going home back into the system. Uh, reincarnation cycle. That's what that means. It means being reunited with your captors. Because you have captors while you're here in the physical. You have captors out there in the astral who are ready and waiting uh, on both ends. Just as long as you're still going along with the show. I loved him and that we were going home. Going home. As we rose together, I said that we would soon be met by our friends. We would soon be met by our friends. Now, again, we've done uh, breakdowns of deathbed visions and visitations, as well as near-death experiences, and even some uh, people who claim that they uh, their ego had died in trip reports, which nobody fully sheds the ego. Let's just get that on the table. Nobody fully sheds the ego as long as they have a body. If you have a body, you have an ego. That doesn't, that doesn't go away. You may improve upon it, but does it ever go away fully? Absolutely not. Okay? That's really, really important. So with the deathbed visions and visitations, you know, they're, they're waiting for, uh, you know, we're going to equate it with this case, how uh, they're waiting for their friends to help them. And what do, what do the friends do? They are facilitators within the realm of the deception. That's what, that is exactly what we're seeing here. We're talking about how if I'm on my deathbed or approaching, you know, approaching death, okay? Say I'm laying on a bed, okay? What's going to happen is, not always, but often, it happens a lot, where you will get a visitation from a deceased loved one, something like your, you know, your, your, your mother, your father, your grandparents, your very close friend, uh, your, some cases, your pet, particularly if you're a child having a near-death experience, you know, we're lumping these in together because the experiences are very similar, okay? It's, it's, there is a facilitator involved with, with attempting to help you quote unquote cross over or uh agree to something okay so with deathbed visions and visitations you could be laying on the bed and uh you know my uh father will come okay and say okay well you know uh your 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 time is about up you're getting close you're you're not dead yet but you're 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 close and we're just here to make the transition easier for you and we'd like you to follow us you're supposed to follow us uh when you leave here so it's uh it's this uh early phase for some people who may need some extra uh counseling and aid to being recycled back into the system i think it's the system has something like a it's almost like a judgment call okay so if if you have a deathbed vision visitation i can't specifically say why someone receives them and why others don't okay there's really no rhyme or reason to it but what i suspect is that the, the system sends out its minions, so to say, to lure them in, okay, and say, okay, yeah, you're, you know, you're, you're probably going to die in the next few days, next couple weeks, whatever it may be, and, uh, you know, you got, you got to come with us. And sometimes it's very emotional experiences uh, where what's, this is the part that just can, you know, 
send me off on a fucking tangent for easily an hour. <laughs> okay. So let me just explain. You have these deathbed visitations. Some of the most glaringly obvious deceptions involve those people who are on their deathbed who are dealing with a family member or somebody in their inner circle most of the time from when they were younger okay so a, a good example I've, I've brought up before is of this woman who has a near-death experience um or i'm sorry not a near-death experience a deathbed vision and visitation she actually died this was okay so i'll correct that um she has the deathbed vision and visitation, has premonitions of her death leading up to the visitations and visions. And she, she ends up meeting her father. Okay? Now, mind you, her father sexually abused her as a child. Her father beat her as a child. And the day... The day she turned 18, she was out of the house. She had a job, was saving up money from, I think, 16 to 18. The day she turned 18, she moved out of the house, left the father, didn't want anything to do with him, didn't talk to him for the rest of her life. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. Sexually abused, beaten, saves money from 16, the legal age she can first start generating income until the age of 18, leaves the house the day she turns 18, gets her own place, disavows her father, disowns her father, doesn't want anything to do with him, doesn't deal with him even when he's sick later on in life, okay? Doesn't even go to visit him when he's on his deathbed. Now, fast forward, okay, she's on her deathbed, and guess who shows up? Guess who shows up? Papa shows up, asking for forgiveness, explaining that this was all, this all happened for a reason. I sexually abused you for, you know, your spiritual development. I beat you for your spiritual development. I abused you for your spiritual development. You didn't deal with me the rest of your life for your spiritual development. And you know what happens? That fucking love bomb comes. That stupid piece of shit love bomb comes. And helps them see the errors of her way. So she doesn't, she doesn't deal with her father from the age of 18 to her age her to, to 70 when she dies father dies i think at 60 at, when she's 60 something along those lines so doesn't deal with him from 18 to 70 or 18 to 60 dies around the age 70 but yet all of a sudden papa shows up and and is apologizing and this and that and yada yada, begging for forgiveness. And everything is just washed away. Washed away, thrown out into the air, no big deal. All is forgiven. Now you tell me. She receives the love bomb. She receives a, a vision and visitation and a premonition from her father on her deathbed. Who the hell wants to deal with that after all those years? And, and again, it's, it's this conversation that ensues that the, where the father is communicating to her, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, I, I didn't mean to do this, you know, it was... It was just, it was supposed to happen, and, uh, you know, I apologize, I apologize, but, uh, you know, I hope you can forgive me, and then a period of forgiveness sets in, and guess what? She talks about going with her father, she's going to go with her father when she dies. Swear to God. 
these cases, when you see them, how can it be interpreted any other way other than it, it, deception and manipulation? How? Again, Stockholm Syndrome on steroids, my friends. That's what the Earth realm provides and all of the astral sub-realms of control attached to it. There is, there is no, Mark, there is no forgiveness and wiggle room for that type of shit because you're going to be manipulated if you fall for that type of trap. What does a person want at the end of their life but closure? They want closure. They want explanations. They want a, a peaceful transition. So what does the system do? It provides the sexually abusive father, the, the physically abusive father. To come back into the life and all of a sudden all is forgiven? Come on. All right, I'll leave it at that. But you get my point. This is the type of shit that goes on. This is just one example. One. I could rap about this for hours on spot out cases of just weird ass shit that's happened with these deathbed visions and visitations where the person is totally going against everything that they stood for for decades multiple decades and yet all is forgiven all is forgiven in a time of vulnerability in a time when they don't necessarily know what's going on and they're taken advantage of you see the egregiousness egregiousness here it is so fucked up. All right, I'll leave it at that. And then parted for a while before being reunited once again. New body soul partnerships. The process of a soul joining with an unborn child is an appropriate end to the case histories I have presented in this book. The soul is now ready to embark on another incarnation adventure with hopes and expectations for a fresh new role in life. The partnership between the physical and etheric minds that usher a whole human being into the world. A fresh new incarnation. Sounds great. Can be smooth or rocky in the early adjustment stages of childhood. Even so, it is the end result and how we finish the course we traveled that counts the most. During our lifetime, the soul and the body are so intertwined that the duality of expression may confuse us as to who we really are. The complexities of this association between body and soul represent an alliance of long evolutionary development, going back perhaps to the late Pleistocene era, when hominoids on this planet were originally considered suitable for soul colonization. The oldest divisions of our modern brain still remain in place as survival mechanisms. Some people such as the soul Clidae in Case 36, acknowledge touching primitive sections of the brain when they enter a fetus. These are the areas that control our visceral physical reactions, which are instinctual and emotional rather than intellectual. Some of my clients have said that a few brains they have joined seemed more primitive than all the others. Ego has been defined as self, conceived as a spiritual substance upon which experience is superimposed. This psyche would define the soul, but there is an ego of a kind relegated to the brain, which experiences the external world through the senses governing action and reaction. It is this functional organism, created before the soul arrived, that the soul must join in a mother. In a sense, there are two egos at work here, and this is most evident to me during regressions when I take my subjects to the ring and later when they join a fetus. It is in the fetus where the body-soul partnership really begins. The soul and brain of a new baby appear to begin their association as two separate and distinct entities and become one mind. Some people are bothered that my two-entity position or duality of body and spirit means that while the immortal character of the soul lives on, 
the temporary personality of the body dies. It needs to be said that the soul and the spirit are two separate things, okay? And then you throw in the body, you got the, again, the trifecta of bullshit uh, rearing its ugly head. The soul is an attachment that you agree to have with you that, quote-unquote, guides you in your life path, your life script, okay? And can be helpful, and it could be a very counterproductive to how you choose to go about your day-to-day -day life and your ambitions, okay? The spirit, on the other hand, is our creative energy our it was that is where we come from it's it's from the creator now what the system has done in my opinion is it has taking it is taking the spirit fragmenting it leaving us with very minimal access to it taking the soul attaching it to the limited spirit we work as creators while we're here to further the deception, the manipulation of the system. And in turn, the system continues to thrive. It continues to progress and build on top of itself. We have been, in many ways uh helpers in this system but that's because we have that soul attachment that clings to us our spirit our quarantine spirit dare i say quarantine spirit okay that's out there in the ether and it grabs little bits and pieces of it here and there that we can you know muster up feel experience connect with but then there's so much of it that's hidden too. And the soul and the brain and the body all act in unison as a governor to prevent you from, prevent us from accessing our true essence, which is our spirit, our pure spirit. You see what's going on here? It's, that's what's, that's, that's the problem. That's how the system thrives. That's how the system grows. Because we have agreed to it. And part of the agreement involves us giving large, large portions of our spirit away that we don't have access to in exchange for the experience, which we have consented to. And in turn... They give us this lovely soul attachment and that acts as a in-betweener, so to say. Uh, it thwarts our progress, okay? Position or duality of body and spirit means that while the immortal character of the soul lives on, the temporary personality of the body dies. Yet it was the soul, in concert with the mind of a body, which created a unique personality of a single self. Although the physical organism of the body will die, the soul who occupied that body never forgets the host which allowed them to experience earth in a particular time and place. We have seen how souls can remember and recreate who they were in certain timelines. Every physical body has its own unique design, and the concepts, ideas, and judgments of any human mind are directly related to the soul who is occupying that body. I endeavored to show in chapters 3 and 4 how some body-soul combinations work more efficiently than others. Physiologists do not know why intense emotion may cause irrational behavior in one person and logical coping actions in another. For me, the answer lies in the soul. When the body-soul partnership is underway in the fetus of a client's current body, I do hear evaluations from many of them about brain circuitry being fine-tuned or a bit jumbled in the new baby. 
The remote fine tuned, a bit jumbled in the baby. From a level five soul about ent- or a bit jumbled in the new baby. The remarks from a level five soul about entering a body are instructive in terms of attachments. No two brains are constructed in precisely the same way. When I initially enter the womb of my mother, I touch the brain gently. I flow in, seeking, probing, searching. It is like osmosis. I know immediately if this brain is going to be smooth or rough sailing for our mutual communication. I will receive my mother's emotional feelings during pregnancy more than her clear thoughts. That's how I know if the baby is wanted or not. And this makes a difference in the baby getting a good or bad start. When I enter the fetus of an unwanted baby, I can make a positive difference by energy engagement with this child. When I was a young soul, I would get caught up with the alienation of a parent and both the child and I felt a separation. I have been working with babies for thousands of years and I can handle whatever sort of child they give me, so we are both fulfilled by coming together. I have too much work to do in life to be slowed down by a body match which does not happen to be perfect for me. We are both fulfilled, both fulfilled, thousands of years, and I can handle whatever sort of child they give me. I can handle So we are both fulfilled by coming together. So we are both fulfilled by coming together. Well, so why don't we get a little more explanation on how that works, okay? We're talking about the body, which is acting again, I will say, over and over till the day I die, that the brain and the body act as a governor on the spirit, preventing you from connecting with your true self as much as possible. Then you come into the world, you're, you're around all of these crazy systems that are put in place, and depending on where you choose to live in your life script, in conjunction with, of course, these wonderful guides and soul groups that aid you along the way and push you into certain areas, certain incarnations, well... Not too friendly. Not too friendly. So the body is essentially an entity in and of itself. Which I will say is the soul. It's a soul attachment. Okay? Your spirit, again, is one thing. Your soul is the entity attachment to try and keep you in line. Keep you going with the flow. I have too much work to do in life to be slowed down by a body match which does not happen to be perfect for me. When a soul reaches level three, most are able to make rapid adjustments once inside a fetus. A subject told me bluntly, when a complex, highly advanced soul combines with a sluggish brain, it is like hitching a racehorse to a plow horse. Usually my clients express this sentiment about bodies in a more deferential manner. There are karmic reasons for all body-soul matches. Also, a high IQ is no indication of an advanced soul. It is not a low IQ. There are karmic, karmic decisions that come along with this. It is like hitching a racehorse to a plow horse. Usually, my clients express this sentiment about bodies in a more deferential manner. There are karmic reasons for all body-soul matches. Also, there are karma, karmic reasons for all body-soul matches. Again, what is karma? Karma is the never-ending guilt trip that you can never perfect yourself to be. Okay? As I say, you want to be a good person for being a good person because that's who you are. Not because you expect something out of it. Not because you are trying to line yourself up properly with God or this or, or deities, all this stuff, your, your family. You do good things because that's what you want to do. But you know, in the grand scheme of things, 
from what I can tell. And this is ah, difficult. From what I can tell, you can do the most egregious, nasty thing possible. But as long as you have an idea as to what the system is all about and how your consent plays a role in all this, it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter. You can still escape. You could still be a sovereign being at the end of the day when you leave your body, regardless of how fucked up you might have lived your life. So, you know, on its face, it sounds screwed up, right? But that's how I see it. That's, that's where it points to. So... A high IQ is no indication of an advanced soul. It is not a low IQ, but the disturbed irrational mind that poses problems for the less experienced souls. As for body matches with the soul, our options are offered to us in good faith for a variety of life designs. Body choices in the ring are never used to trap us into something unsuitable for our development. No, it wouldn't be there to trap you. No. Options are offered to us in good faith for a variety of life good designs. Faith. Good faith. Body choices in the ring are never used to trap us into something unsuitable no, for our development. Never do that. The sphere of life selection is not a department store fire sale of merchandise. The planners have no interest in sandbagging some unsuspecting soul with a poor quality body. Wow. Wow. I couldn't disagree more with that. Because it's not just about the guides, right? It's about your soul group, okay? It's about the peer pressure. That's what we keep talking about, how this, this whole system is based off of peer pressure. And how you're, they are going to bend your will and get you to consent no matter what. You're so lost in the sauce. That's the best way to look at it. Lost in the sauce. You're, you're all over the place. You're, you're getting information here, getting information there. You got the past lives ringing up in your head. You got the, the perceived karmic uh, implications of everything. Come on now. I mean, it couldn't be more obvious. It's just, it's crazy. There is purpose for both egos behind everybody's soul match. While the body delights the soul as a means of both physical and mental expression, it is capable of bringing great pain. The lesson of this merger is to forge a harmonious unification of body and soul so that they function as one unit. Very harmonious. I have two perspectives that illustrate this collaboration. I am a volatile soul with hasty inclinations, and I prefer aggressive bodies with temperaments which complement my own inclinations. We call this sort of combination of mirror images a double-double, I can never slow down. I must admit the quiet bodies with non-combative minds do calm me, but then I tend to become very lazy and complacent. I am comfortable with emotionally cold hosts. I, I am comfortable with emotionally cold hosts. So love analytical to calm me, but then I tend to become very lazy and complacent. I am comfortable with emotionally cold hosts. I also love analytical minds, so we can take our time before committing to things. Inside Jane, it's as though I'm on a roller coaster ride. She's so reckless, jumping into situations. I mean, I try to drag her back, but she gets so out of control, she brings us a lot of pain. Yet there is much joy, too. It's all overwhelming, but what a wild ride. Certain body matches do produce lives of frustration and very difficult challenges. However, only a couple of times in my entire career have I ever had a soul who admitted they asked to be replaced in a fetus it found impossible to adjust to in any way. In both cases, another soul took its place before the eighth month. A prenatal exchange due to incompatibility is an extremely rare occurrence, because this is what the life selection room is all about. 
In chapter 3, where I discussed people who engage in wrongdoing, I explained how our inner soul self might not be in harmony with our body. I also said that no soul is innately evil when it joins a fetus. Still, the soul does not enter with a blank slate, either. A soul's immortal character is influenced by all the attributes and temperament of the brain, which challenges the soul's maturity. I have said there are souls who are more susceptible than others in falling prey to negative influences in life. Most of the cases in this book reflect souls who struggle in opposition or work in harmonious conjunction with their bodies. Souls combating the need to control may not blend well with a body ego disposed to confrontation. On the other hand, a cautious low-energy soul could choose a rather passive introverted body temperament in order to institute boldness in concert with its host. When a soul joins with a new baby, I can be... With its host. With its host. Let's hear that again. Confrontation. On the other hand, a cautious low-energy soul could choose a rather passive introverted body temperament in order to institute boldness in concert with its host. In concert when a soul with joins host. with a new baby, I can be fairly sure the partnership will address both the soul's shortcomings and a body-mind who needs this particular soul. The planners choose bodies for us which are intended to combine our character defects with certain body temperaments to produce... The planners. Again, we heard the planners. That's you again... Me agreeing to give our sovereignty away. We're giving it away to the planners. And the planners are lined up, uh, you know, outside the gate and saying, okay, next. All right, let's see uh, how we could uh, weasel as much out of this one as possible. And it's like an assembly line. Just next. Come on, let's go. Step up. Uh, we're gonna rob you. Who are we gonna? Whose sovereignty are we gonna rob next? Step right up. Oh, it's crazy. To combine our character defects with certain body temperaments to produce specific personality combinations. From clients who are medical doctors and physiologists, I have been given brief anatomical glimpses about souls entering the developing brain of a fetus. Case 66 is an example. Post-hypnotic suggestions have enabled subjects in these professions to sketch out simplified diagrams of what they were trying to say about these linkages while under hypnosis. This has helped my understanding. Case 66. Dr. N. I would like to know if the initial transition into the fetus is always about the same for you. Subject. No, it is not. Even though I might have had X-ray vision into the mind of the child during life selection, my entry can still be ragged. Dr. N. Give me your most recent example of a difficult entry. Subject. Three lives ago, I joined with a very stiff, unreceptive brain. It felt my presence was invasive. This was unusual because most of my host bodies accept my presence. It felt my presence was invasive, yet this plan is put in place prior to arriving about body selection and life scripts, but yet the one who's cast into the body is considered invasive? Really? Interesting. Joined with a very stiff, unreceptive brain. It felt my presence was invasive. This was unusual because most of my host bodies accept my presence. I'm ordinarily considered to be a new roommate. Dr. N. Are you saying this particular host body felt you were an alien presence that it should reject? Subject. No. It was a dull mind of dense energy pockets. My arrival was an intrusion on its lack of mental activity. There was isolation between compartments of the brain creating resistance to communication. Lethargic minds require more effort on my part. They resist change. Dr. N. Change of what? Subject. Of my being in its space, requiring some reaction to deal with this fact. 
I caused this mind to think, and it was not a curious mind. I began pushing buttons and found it did not want to be summoned by me. Dr. N. What did you expect? Subject. From my review in the sphere, the ring, I saw the end result of an adult mind, but I didn't see all the difficulties with the baby's mind when it was new. Dr. N. I see. And are you saying this mind considered your intrusion as a threat? Subject. No, only a nuisance. Eventually I was accepted and the child and I adapted to each other. Dr. N. Let's go back to your statement about pushing buttons. Please explain to me what this means to you, with a standard entry into the fetus of your choice. Subject. When I enter a developing brain, I am accustomed to joining around the fourth month. Our guides give us some latitude here, but I never enter after the sixth month. Our guides give us some latitude here. Well, that's good. I'm, gl I'm glad the guides are, you know, aiding in this very important moment of uh, not wanting to deal with a body. I mean, really, with pre-birth memories and near-death experiences, all you constantly hear, again, you constantly hear, I didn't want to come back. Amazing how all these people who have these experiences and recollections, they say, I didn't want to come back. And I did a video on that uh, quite a few months back. I don't know. You can look it up. It's very short. I think a 15, 20-minute video where, again, it's, it's, that's the exact topic I talk about, how in pre-birth memories and near-death experiences say, I didn't want to come back. All these people saying, I didn't want to come back. But yet they do because they're manipulated and deceived in the coming back. When I enter the womb of the mother, I create a red light of tight energy and direct it up and down the spinal column of the baby, following a network of neurons to the brain. Dr. N. Why do you do that? Subject. This tells me about the efficiency of thought transmission, the sensory relays. Dr. N. Then what do you do? Subject, play my red light around the dura matter, the outer layer of the brain, gently. Dr. N, why red light? Subject, this allows me to be especially sensitive to the physical feelings of this new person. I meld my energy warmth to the gray blues of brain matter. Before I get there, the brain is simply gray. What I am doing is turning on the lights in a dark room with a tree in the middle. Dr. N, you lost me. Explain about the tree. Subject, intensely. The tree is the stem. I park myself between the two hemispheres of the brain to get a ringside seat as to how this system will function. Then I move around the branches of the tree to investigate the circuitry. I want to know how dense the energy is in the fibers around the wheel of the cerebral cortex folding around the thalamus. I want to learn how this brain thinks and senses things. Dr. N. I want to learn how this brain thinks. On the wheel of the cerebral cortex folding around the thalamus. I want to learn how this brain thinks and senses things. Good luck figuring that part out. You're cast into something that is not organic to your natural state. And we're all experiencing it right now. We're in the body. It's not our organic state. Again, we are born under the veil of forgetfulness with no recollection of who we are, where we came from, or why we are here. There's a reason the veil of forgetfulness exists. And that's because, first, we agreed to it. But second, it's because that's the nail in the Matrix Reincarnation Soul Traps coffin. The memory wipe is the biggest way to see this for what it is. Because 
had there not been a memory wipe involved with all this, then you can say, okay, well, you know, you could you could make a lot more excuses for what's going on here. And I am not going to sit here and deal with people who say, oh, well, you know, re reincarnation and the memory wipe, it's, it's for our spiritual development. I mean, really? Are you seriously? I mean, how many people, I'm sure many of you have run across it, who will just excuse away, again, every, everything, any, any excuse they could dig up out of their pocket and use to make themselves feel better, they'll use. And the memory wipe is one of them. Oh, it's part of your spiritual evolution. It's God's plan. Yada, yada, yada. Are you kidding me? Come on. The memory wipe is the nail in the coffin for all this. It's what it should it's what you start your base work off of and then you work out with things like NDEs, pre-birth memories, life between lives, past life regression slash past life regression, you know, all this stuff. DMT, ayahuasca trip reports, all this stuff. It paints the picture so so clearly. So again, for any of my friends out there who are on the fence, just stick with it. Stick with it. I promise you, at some point it'll come to you. If you're really, really new to this stuff, it's going to take a year or two. It will. I'm not going to lie. And depending on how much time you have, maybe it could take some less, less time. But just hang in there. Again, my channel's only a stepping stone. You should be taking the, the information I'm sharing in my videos and just keeping your eye out that's all keeping your eyes and ears out for all the tells because what i'm trying to do is just show you the inconsistencies about what we're hearing versus the translation of everything's love light rainbows and unicorns by other people okay it's about using our common sense our critical thinking abilities and applying it to everything and anything not just everyday life experience, but all of the categories related within the Matrix Reincarnation Soul Trap. And again, I have a series that is going to be starting sometime soon. And it's going to be a act as a research guide. So you can go out and prove these things to yourself step by step. Again, it's only going to be a short little guide. And... You should always be using your own discernment, your own critical thinking abilities, and applying it to everything and anything as it pertains to this and, of course, everything else in life. Because at the end of the day, you, you will it's the most rewarding thing you can ever spend your time on. All this other stuff, you know, worried about, you know, the Injectinator 5000 or government or this or that. I mean, that's just, who cares? So that's part of the illusion. That's part of the control structure. What you want to do is be able to dissect that control structure as far as you can. And then you'll reap the rewards at the end of all of that, which is great. Dr. N, how important is energy density or the lack of it in the brain? Subject, a mind that has excessive density in certain areas means there are blockages which inhibit the bridges between efficient neuron activity. I want to make some adjustments in these roadblocks with my energy if I can. You know, while the brain is still forming. Dr. N. You can make a difference in how the brain develops? Subject laughs at me. Of course! Did you think souls are passengers on a train? I stimulate these areas ever so slightly. Dr. N. Deliberately obtuse. Well, I thought you and the baby are both in miniature by the way you exhibit intelligence in the beginning. Subject. Laughs. <laughs> Not until birth. Dr. N. Are you saying that you can improve brainwave function with all these activities you have described? Subject. That is our expectation. The whole idea is matching your vibrational levels and capabilities with that of the natural rhythms of the child's brain waves, their electrical flow, with exuberance. 
I think my host bodies are grateful for my assistance in improving the speed of thought over bridges. Stops and then adds, Maybe this is wishful thinking. Dr. N., what do you see in the future for the brain with continued evolution and the influence of souls as a stimulus? Subject. Mental telepathy. Certainly, I have had younger souls who appear to be more inactive after body entry than Case 66. This is a far sight better than agitating the child by ineptness from overzealous and experienced souls. The average soul probes their new host for information but in a way that has been described as tickling the child to give it pleasure. Essentially, this is an important time for integration between body and soul, with the mother also mentally entering into this process of getting a... I'm sorry, does that not sound creepy? Or is it just me? Sounds creepy as hell. ...and experienced souls. The average soul probes their new host for information, but in a way that has been described as tickling the child to give it pleasure. Essentially, this Creepy. is an important time for integration between body and soul, with the mother also mentally entering into this process of getting acquainted. By no means is the seat of the soul limited to the brain. Soul energy radiates throughout the whole body of the child. Case 66 is a medical doctor. My next case comes from a non-medically oriented client about the union of two entities to form one whole as a new life begins. Each soul has its own preferences about when and how they wish to enter the fetus. The following case gives us an indication of the procedures used by a very considerate, evolved soul. Case 67 Dr. N. Tell me what it is like to enter the mind of a baby and when you usually enter. Subject. In the beginning, I think of it as a betrothal. I entered my current body in the eighth month. I prefer to enter on the late side, when the brain is larger, so I have more to work with during the coupling. Dr. N. Isn't there a downside to entering late? I mean, you are then dealing with a more independent individual. Subject. Some of my friends feel that way. I don't. I want to be able to talk with the child when there is more mutual awareness. Dr. N. Being dense to elicit a response. Talk? Talk to a fetus? What are you saying? Subject laughs at me. Of course we interact with the child. Dr. N. Take me through this slowly. Who says what first? Subject. The child may say... Who are you? I answer, A friend who has come to play and be a part of you. Dr. N., with deliberate provocation. Isn't that deceitful? You haven't come to play. You have come to occupy this mind. Subject, Oh, please! Who have you been talking to? This mind and my soul were created to be together. Do you think I... Wow. Wow. Talk about just laying it right out there for everyone to see. we got to rewind this part because it's really important. Take me through this slowly. Who says what first? Subject. The child may say, Who are you? I answer, A friend who has come to play and be a part of you. Dr. N. With deliberate provocation. Isn't that deceitful? You have a friend who has come to play with you, Dr. Anna, isn't that deceitful? I haven't come to play. You have come to occupy this mind. I've come to occupy this mind. I've come to occupy this mind. I mean, really? How much, you know, we're just going to keep compounding the truth bombs on top of each other. It creates such a... An amazing narrative of truth. This entire, I mean, both of his books, Journey of Souls, Destiny of Souls, and then there's some other stuff I'm going to get into with him down the road, too. But uh, his questioning really helps expose and, and um, 
Open the whole can of worms on all this stuff. But make no doubt about it. Michael Newton uh, was picked for a reason by the system to uh, excuse away everything. And even though he ran into people throughout his career who put him to task and said, hey, where does, you know, sovereign, where does sovereignty and free will come into play with all this stuff? And again, what does he do every single step of the way? He excuses everything. Everything is just, you know, everything is just chalked up to spiritual evolution. Everything. Everything's about, you know, everything is the way it is for a reason. It couldn't possibly be, you know, counterproductive to your spiritual growth, right? No, no, we're not going to put that on the table. Come on. It's right here, my friends, all in our face. Subject. Oh, please. Who have you been talking to? Who have you been this talking? mind and my soul were created to be together. This mind and my soul were created to be together. This mind and this soul were created to be together. That's right. They were, you were put into a corner to go along with the show. That, that's what comes with incarnating here. That agreement. The agreement of merging your spirit, the parasitic soul, and the body into one. And the worst part and most egregious part of all this is that your spirit, your true essence, is quarantined away off in the where who got who knows where. And the system has just got its little parasites clamping to you every chance it can get to keep you under control, to keep you going along with the show. And doing as you're told. And if you don't, well, it turns on you. It can turn on you. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen every time. But if there is a threat to you wanting to go down the sovereign route, then make no doubt about it, you're going to run into bullshit a lot. Because I have. Okay, I have experienced this a number of times. But my resolve for fighting it and knowing that sovereignty and consent and free will reign over everything and anything more than what the system would like to cast down on me and work its little parasitic cans all over me to try and get me to go in a certain direction i say no and you should say you should say no because not gonna allow it not gonna allow it we're taking control of ourselves we are the last timers we're not going to allow this type of bullshit to continue this mind and my soul were created to be together Ugh. Do you think I am some sort of foreign intruder on Earth? Yeah. I have joined with babies who welcomed me as if I were expected. Dr. N. There are souls who have had a different experience. Subject. Look, I know souls who are clumsy. They go in like bulls in a china shop with all their over-eagerness to get started with an agenda. Too much frontal energy all at once sets up resistance. Dr. N. In your current lifetime, was the child at all anxious about your entry? Subject. No, they don't know enough yet to be anxious. I begin by caressing the brain. I am able to immediately project warm thoughts of love and companionship. Most of the babies just accept me as being part of themselves. Most of the babies just accept me as being part of themselves. I work on warming you, caressing you with love and deception and all sorts of uh, fuckery until you submit. And what happens when you're a baby, right? You're 
not fully developed. Think about, uh, I mean, really, I have a whole segment on how the human body in and of itself is clearly, undeniably set up in a way for you to be compliant. The human body, the brain, has, excuse me, incredible flaws, which are by design. And they're like that. You're born a baby, you're born ignorant under the veil of forgetfulness, but you do retain more memories in your very young years versus after the age of seven. But what ha what's going on between the time you're born and age seven? Your communication skills aren't as good. Okay? You're... The, you're, you're, you're it's like you're an old spirit and quote-unquote soul in a new body that is developing and only capable of conveying so much. You see how the scam works so well? It's incredible. It's incredible how this system is able to to just work the way it does, but it's because they have everything thought, everything you could think of, they have thought of in order to take advantage of us. It is endless. The brain. I am able to immediately project warm thoughts of love and companionship. Most of the babies just accept me as being part of themselves. A few hold back, like my current body. Dr. N. Oh, really? What was unusual about this fetus? Subject. It wasn't a big deal. Its thoughts were... Now that you are here, who am I going to be? Dr. N. I think that's a very big deal. Essentially, the child is acknowledging that its identity depends on you. Subject. Pay Essentially, the identity is relying on you. Wow. But yeah, everything's love and light, right? Everything's, every, you know, every, it's a learning experience. Everything's for a learning experience. No, your sovereignty means nothing. Get in line. Do as you're told. Accept this parasite that's attached to you. And you go with it. See this? I mean, it's just so... Ugh. Dr. N. I think that's a very big deal. It is. Essentially, the child is acknowledging that its identity depends on you. Yes. Subject. Patiently. The child has begun to ask itself... Who am I? Some children are more aware of this than others. A few are resistant because, to them, we are an irritation to their inert beginnings, like a pearl in an oyster. Dr. N. Wow. So you don't feel the child senses it is being forced to give up something of its individuality? Subject. No, we have come as souls to give the child depth of personality. Its being is enhanced by our presence. Without us, they would largely function as unripened fruit. Dr. N. But does the child understand any of this before birth? Subject. It only knows that I want to be friends so we can do things together. Wow. Talk about a truth bomb and a half right there, my friends. Let's rewind that. Very, very important. Us, they would largely function as unripened fruit. Dr. N. But does the child understand any of this before birth? Does the child understand? Subject. It only knows that I want to be friends so we can do things together. It only knows that we want to be friends so we can do things together. Boy, a lot of sovereignty in that decision making, huh? It just wants to be friends, that's all. Just wants to be friends. It just wants to go on, you know, some camping trips, wants to go out and, you know, ride a bike and go enjoy uh, the arcade and, yeah, yeah, nothing, nothing uh, screwy about any of this. No, no, couldn't be. We begin by communicating with each other with simple things, such as an uncomfortable body position in the mother's womb. There have been times 
when the umbilical cord was wrapped around the neck of the baby, and I have calmed the child where otherwise it might have squirmed and made things worse. Dr. N., please continue with how you assist the baby. Yeah. Subject. I prepare the child for birth, which is going to be a shock when it happens. Imagine being forced out of a warm, comfortable, secure womb into the bright lights of a hospital room. Ugh. The noise, having to breathe air, uh. being handled. The child appreciates my help because my primary goal now is to combat fear by soothing the brain with assurances that everything will be fine. Dr. N., I wonder what it was like for children before souls came to help them. Subject. The brain was too primitive then to conceptualize the trauma of birthing. There was little awareness. Laughs. Of course, I wasn't around in those days. Dr. N. Are you able to calm anxious mothers in any way? Subject. We must be proficient. During much of my existence... I had little or no effect on my mothers if they were frightened, sad, or angry during pregnancy. You must be able to align your energy vibrations with both the child and the mother's natural body rhythms. You have to harmonize three sets of wave levels, which includes your own, to soothe the mother. I might even have the baby kick the mother to let her know we are all right. Dr. N. Then at birth, I suppose the hard work of the merger is over? Subject. To be honest, the merger isn't complete yet for me. I talk to my body as a second entity up to the age of six. Ah, see, well, we, again, we go back to exactly what we were talking about earlier. We've talked about it on numerous, numerous streams about how the body up until, I mean, I say six or seven, but technically, according to science, it's six. You are in a state where you are just a sponge for your surroundings. And your life later on in adulthood, teenage years, is dictated based on those first six or seven years of your surroundings. That's why it's so important. Again, like we talked about early, early on in this stream, the famous Jesuit quote, Give me the boy until the age of six or seven. I'll show you the man. That's because they know. They know the value of how easily manipulated you are at that point. Because you're just a sponge for your surroundings. And what that does is it helps mold you for later periods in your life. And by then, you're cooked. Unless you're like us, where you question everything and don't take any bullshit from anybody and have sovereignty in your your heart, your mind, your spirit. That's what it's all about. It's about having that embedded within you and not wavering under any circumstances to anything. Stand firm. Stand tall. And don't allow these things to control you. It is better not to force a full meld right away. We play games as two people for a while. Dr. N. I have noticed a lot of young children talk to themselves as if they were with an imaginary playmate. Is that their soul? Subject. Grinning. That's right. Although our guides enjoy playing with us as young children, too. Is that your soul? Is that your soul? And the guides like to play along too. Really important because we're talking about the soul versus the spirit. Very, very different things. I have noticed a lot of young children talk to themselves as if they were with an imaginary playmate. Is that their soul? Subject. Grinning. That's right. Although our guides enjoy playing with us as young children too. And have you also noticed the elderly talking to themselves a lot? They are preparing for separation at the other end, in their own way. Dr. N. In general, how do you feel about coming back to Earth in life after life? Subject. As a gift. This... Uh.
A gift. Oh, yeah, some, some gift. Such a great gift. This is such a multifaceted planet. Ah. Oh. Sure, this place brings heartache, but it is delightful, too, and incredibly beautiful. The human body is a marvel of form and structure. I never cease to be awed by each new body, the many different ways I can express myself in them, especially in the most important way. Love. Wow. Okay. That was the conclusion of Chapter 9. We're going to... <laughs> I mean, really, what needs to be said right there, right? I mean, I think we covered quite a bit. All right, we're moving into the last and final chapter, which is Chapter 10. It is only 18 minutes and 36 seconds long, so hang in there with me. I'll try to keep the commentary to a minimum, but uh, Michael Newton does a really good job at uh, pissing me off at the end of each of his books because it's all about um, propping up the realm, propping up the fuckery, propping up the atrocities, uh, every which way imaginable, and uh, excusing away everything. So, here we go. Chapter 9, my friends. Or chapter 10, sorry, chapter 10. 10. Our Spiritual Path The concept of our resurrection into beings who belong in a kingdom of eternity goes far back into human antiquity. From our early origins, we have believed that life and afterlife are sustained by divine intelligence as a single, unified whole. These sentiments come from the memories of many people I have regressed to the Stone Age. For ages since then, we thought of the soul world as another state of consciousness, rather than an abstract place. The afterlife was considered to be only an extension of our physical life. I believe the world is returning to those concepts which were beautifully expressed by Spinoza, who said... All the cosmos is a single substance of which we are a part. God is not an external manifestation, but everything that is. I consider such legends as Atlantis and Shangri-La as having their origins in the eternal longing we feel for recapturing a utopia that once existed but is now lost. In the superconscious mind of every person I have ever placed in deep hypnosis... Ah. All right, let's start this off. Atlantis, from what I can tell, rode a very similar path to the way America and most of the world is functioning at this moment in time and has been since its inception, okay? Now... I spent way more time than I care to admit on Atlantis stuff. And what you come to realize is that, yes, Atlantis more than likely existed, okay? It was an advanced culture and society, highly technologically evolved. But it became too much, okay? It, it abused all sorts of things, and it fell as a result of those abuses. And that's exactly what we're reliving right now in our modern time. It's like a reliving of Atlantis, just repackaged under a new label. Okay? Now, again, make of it what you will, but what he's saying is, is Atlantis was this incredibly enlightened society, Enlightened society does not mean you treat your citizens like shit. Enlightened doesn't mean just because you're technologically evolved that you're actually doing good. Okay? Atlantis, from everything we can tell, it fell because of it going too far. Taking your liberties taking your free will, trying to steal everything and anything that it could. And some people say, oh, well, it was just a select few, and that select few are the one that did it, but I don't care. I don't want to hear the excuses. What do we see again with Atlantis? A 
an epoch in time that did the same egregious shit that's going on today. What's the most logical conclusion you can come up with as it pertains to Atlantis in comparison to not just itself, but every moment in history that, again, we have an idea that the same pervasive bullshit continues on and on and on and on and on. And what is that? That's the, the soul-sucking energy to come in there and try and steal your, your sovereignty at every cost. Apply suffering at every single cost. It's just, you know, the hidden hand. The hidden hand that's there all the time guiding humanity towards its destruction and suffering. And then what do they do? They reset the realm all over again. Hit that button, that reset button, for whatever the reason may be, either because society actually does start to figure out the scam going on here. That is one I am pretty convinced of and kind of just came up with uh, on my own. It doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but think about it this way. Uh, we know humanity has had multiple resets. So what's with the resets? It begs the question that if society starts to become in tune with the scam and deception and manipulation that goes on here and, and starts to find within themselves the true essence that they hold, they might not have it all, just like we don't. We don't have access to our all of our true essence, our spirit. But in time... If people figure out that they're inside of a scam and that, yes, the body, the brain, ha the soul keeps us limited and quarantined, so to say, then what would the Matrix do? If you, you, the best thing I could tell each and every one of you, you have to look at this realm as if you were the parasite. Put yourself in the shoes of being one of the parasitic controllers. What would you do? Say, if, if I want to go and prey on innocent spirits and, and, and take advantage of them, what am I going to do? I'm going to make the conditions as rough as possible. I'm going to run multiple simulations throughout the realm, like America. America will get a little more freedom than this country, etc. And, and you try out different simulations around the realm to see... Which one is providing the most fruitful results? Which one is helping humanity uh, get lost as, as lost as possible? But with the goal in mind being retention. Retention of spirits is to the highest degree possible. Because that's really all that matters in the end, right? And all that matters is that it, very few people figure out the scam while they're here because once you're over in the afterlife and you fall for your the deception of your deceased loved ones and and your attachments and 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 all this stuff the system's got you it doesn't give a shit the system's got you next we have to deal with the ones who are you know starting to become a little too informed so what happens society becomes maybe a little too informed and la la what does the Matrix do? It hits the reset button. Eh. So uh, I've suggested that the resets may in fact be sometimes regional based on certain regions becoming enlightened to the scam versus other areas of the realm that are still buying into the scam and the simulation the control simulation system that is being run over there is a lot more successful. You see what I'm saying? So that's just my opinion on it. Doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but when you when you understand that the whole system is based on us being deceived and and lied to and taken advantage of, and at the end of the day when we die, what it wants is to suck us back up and recycle us back into the system 
it only makes sense that they would run multiple simulations and that if a society or a culture becomes too enlightened over another, they would obviously hit the reset button. Sometimes maybe the whole realm becomes enlightened. Not good. Reset. Then what happens? The memory wipe in, uh, reinstates itself. Everyone goes through the light. Blah, blah. They forget everything. Society is jump-started again. And then, boom. We're off to the races again. Think about it. It's really, really compelling stuff to think about. Uh, it gets the wheels turning in my head so much. When you look at things as if you are the controller of the system, it really starts to shed light on things. Uh, think about just nature in general and the, and the beauty of outside. Okay? Going out in the nature, communing with nature, being able to heal in nature. Think about how great that is. So think about it. If you're a controller, what are you going to do? You're going to set up a realm that looks pretty, looks nice, can heal, can help. But the control structure that's got its boot on your fucking ass all day from cradle to grave. Well, at least you got some nice scenery. You can't have it all look like fire and brimstone, my friends. There has to be a balance there to keep the scam going. It can't all be negative. It can't all be positive. I mean, it can't all be. It can't all be positive. It's got to be negative. It's got. It's got. You get what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, that's my point. Very, very important things to just you know contemplate on your own. Osis lies the memory of a utopian home. Originally, the concept of utopia was intended to illustrate ideas, not a society. My subjects see the spirit world as a community of ideas. In this sense, the afterlife involves self-purification of thought. Beings who are still incarnating are far from perfect, as demonstrated in my cases. Nevertheless, we can justifiably think of our existence in the spirit world as utopian because there is a universal harmony of spirit. Righteousness, honesty, humor, and love are the primary foundations of our life after life. After hearing the information contained in this book, I know it must seem cruel that the utopia of our dreams does exist within all of us, but is blocked from conscious memory by amnesia. When some of these blocks are overcome through hypnosis, meditation, prayer, channeling, yoga, imagination, and dreams, or a mental state reached through physical exertion, there is a sense of personal empowerment. Some 2,400 years ago, Plato wrote about reincarnation and said that souls must travel over Lethe, the river of forgetfulness, whose waters produce a loss of memory from our true nature. The sacred truths of our etheric history can be recovered today because we are able to circumvent the conscious mind and reach the unconscious, which was not immersed in the river of forgetfulness. Our higher self remembers our past triumphs and transgressions in a selective way, whispering to us across time and space. Our personal spirit guides endeavor to give us the best from both worlds, the ethereal and material. Uh, no, they don't. No, they don't. I don't know about you. Okay, again, there could be a, a few exceptions here and there, but I, I wasn't getting this uh, incredible guidance throughout my life from exterior forces that I knew existed. You see the point? There's a difference between feeling like you might have some guidance that is positive in nature versus knowing the goddamn thing exists in the first place. Each new baby is given a fresh start with an open future. Our spiritual masters wish to produce karmic opportunity without the constraints of our knowing those pitfalls we experienced in former lives. They become more lenient in a selective way with amnesia as we engage in self-discovery. Oh, that's nice. They're, they're selective amnesia. They're, they're a little more lenient. 
How kind, how kind. Spiritual masters wish to produce karmic opportunities. Masters. Without the constraints of our knowing those pitfalls we experienced in former lives. Fuck out of here. They become more lenient in a selective way with amnesia. Yeah, they become more lenient in a selective way with amnesia. Here you hear, you know, Dr. Newton, you know, wah, 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 wah. All I hear is a Charlie Brown teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Rape is okay. Murder is okay. You know, uh, child endangerment's okay. Mental and physical abuse, all okay. Everything's fine. No big deal. Child slavery is fine. Come on. Or slavery is fine. Come on. As we engage in self-discovery. This is our best route to wisdom. The question has been fairly asked as to why amnesia blocks about our spiritual life have been loosened to permit research into the spirit world. I think about this... Have been loosened? Loosened? Seems to have always been a thing with us and our desire to seek answers to the spirit world. I think humanity throughout its entire history has been like that. I don't think the system has a choice. It's embedded and ingrained in us to seek. It's embedded in us to ask questions and try and uh, tap into our true essence and, dare I say it, find guidance through other things, other entities. Have been loosened to permit research into the spirit world. Loosened. It's loosened. I think about this issue a great deal because now, in the 21st century, I expect younger hypnotherapists to go far beyond what my generation has been able to accomplish in unlocking the spiritual mind. I feel the reasons for our ability to discover more of the mysteries about life on the other side is a direct outgrowth of living in the 20th century. The advancement of innovative techniques in hypnosis would have to be listed as a consideration. However, I believe there are more compelling reasons why our amnesia has become less constrictive over the last 30 years. Less constrictive... Okay, let, let's get it straight. I mean, especially with something like near-death experiences. It's not that long ago that we had resuscitation efforts. You know, like the paddles, clear! Those types of things. Where you jumpstart the heart and bring people back to life. I mean, that's... I mean, it's not that old. Okay, the, that's why we have these types of stories. But you know what the system has done? is it's tailored these near-death experiences and past-life regressions to, yes, identify some truths, but at the same time, keep a lid on everything. Keep, a uh, again, a fragmentation of the, of the true self from being discovered as much as it can. It cannot put the lid on completely. It's impossible. It's impossible. That's why I even feel... Um, now, mind you, we're going towards a transhumanism agenda. That's what humanity's future involves. And it's pretty clear that this was the case at some point in humanity's history in the past. Now, how in-depth it was, it seems pretty goddamn in-depth. Not gonna lie. I mean, you can see it depicted in imagery all of the world but uh you know egypt was a big one um the mayans were a big one uh where you can see half human half animal or or a mixing of something where it uh, where there's clearly something depicting a level of transhumanism okay and where is humanity headed now we we clearly had a reset not that long ago, I don't know how long ago, but not that long ago, of humanity, and we're just going through the same cycle all over again. Because it works. It works. 
they're testing out little mini simulations around the realm but it but the end goal is the same you make life as difficult as possible you throw as many people as possible into anxiety depression etc uh and all these physical ailments you you thwart progress for medical studies and and medical advancements very even basic things that can help people you thwart it at every possible in every possible way okay and then what do you do you throw medication at the problem fine medications can help at times but are they something that should be used long term i don't i don't know you have to use your own judgment i'm not a doctor but given what we know if humanity's uh end goal at this moment is clearly transhumanism what are you going to do you're not going to provide the fucking solution right you're not you're not going to provide the solution when you don't have everything all set up and ready to go yet but when elon musk struts his parasitic piece of shit ass out onto the stage and says okay humanity step right up i got this brain chip for you and it is gonna solve your depression it's gonna solve your anxiety it's gonna stop your pain it's gonna give you vision again you can hear again whatever the hell the infliction may be someone like musk is gonna come out and announce it and say okay it's available for everybody and guess what it's going to be it's going to be a little expensive in the beginning but that's because you know they want to extract money out of people but long term long term mark my words transhumanism will be a regular thing and if it's not free it'll be something that is affordable for every single person on earth and it will make big claims that it will be able to help you in your everyday life and cure things that have possibly plagued you your entire life or large periods of your life. Okay? That's where this is headed. I mean, who the hell wants to come back to that mess? Never before has such a variety of drugs been so pervasive in the human population. Oh, shit. These mind-altering chemicals imprison the soul within a body encumbered by a mental fog. Oh. The soul's essence is unable to express itself through a chemically addicted mind. I feel the planners on the other side have lost patience with this aspect of human society. There are other reasons as well lost patience yet they're the one that sets up the goddamn system they're the one that sets up this fucking parasitical bullshit and again oh they're getting sick of humanity oh well fuck you then seriously you kidding me as the 20th century draws to a close we live in a frantic rage-filled overpopulated environmentally degraded world the mass destruction of our planet in the last hundred years from all sources is unequaled in human experience. Uh, I do not have a dark vision. A never-ending guilt trip. You are born into a world where you have a certain line of things available to you, like oil, like gas, like we were talking about earlier, like a vehicle that runs on gas. A throwaway society that buys endless amounts of shit and just throws it away. Doesn't think twice. But it has nothing to do with the societal aspect of it. It has to do with the systems put in place that drive society in that direction. And yet here we have good old Michael Newton, just like all the other parasites out there that you hear, trying to make us feel guilty. Well, fuck you. ...of the future, despite my comments. It may be true that to the people who are living in an era, their time seems more decadent than the last. 
Yet we have made great advancements culturally, politically, and economically in the last hundred years. Oh, yeah, economically it's In many ways, the world is a far safer place than it was in 1950. Internationally, nations have more social conscience and commitments to work for peace than ever before in our long history of monarchies and dictatorships. Uh, Okay, let's, again, let's not, you know, there's so much wrong, I'm probably just going to be exploding left and right on this, this, because he always ends these books just with utter ridiculousness. We're dealing with tyrannical bullshit governments all over the realm, and they all work together. That's the bottom line. I don't care if you believe it or not. They all work together to serve the same purpose. They answer to those above them. But they all work in unison. There are all these little fake uh, uh, enemies out there. Uh, Iran. North Korea. You name Palestine. Come on, Palestine's really... Let's get real. All this stuff, okay? All these fake enemies. And what are they there for? They're there to scare the shit out of you. They're there to make you feel... Is if you need daddy government to take care of you. Don't worry. Oh, well, I can't control Iran or North Korea's uh, motivations. They want me dead. They want a North. They want a, um, a so-called nuclear weapon. And we're not even going to go down that route. It's bannable material right there. But point is is these enemies are put in place to scare the shit out of you they put them on the six o'clock news five o'clock news eight o'clock news and you're what do you what you're you're you grow into just thinking that oh this one's against our freedom this one's against that this one there's all this trouble in the world russia's gonna get us bob i mean you name it meanwhile they're all working together Every freaking last one of them. There are, they're all on the same side. All of them. Which was still very much in evidence at the start of the 20th century. What we face in the 21st century is the eroding of individualism and human dignity in an overcrowded society dominated by materialism. Okay. Overcrowded society. Here we go. So Newton's obviously got to put in the overpop, you know, overpopulation thing, which we all. I mean, anyone who who has traveled just a little bit in their life, it doesn't even have to be that far. But if you grow up in a city, this is why people think overpopulation is actually a thing. They grow up in a city, or they live in a city, move to a city. And what happens when you're in a city? You see people everywhere. You see buildings everywhere. You see everything condensed into this one area. But what happens when you go outside of a city? Oh, my God. You go outside of a city, you see hundreds of thousands of miles of bare land all over the place. But yet, oh, oh my God, everything is just so, you know, the world is overpopulated. We got to do something about it. And materialism? Well, who provided materialism? The control structure. How cute. How fucking cute is that? We face in the 21st century is the eroding of individualism and human dignity in an overcrowded society dominated by materialism. Globalization, urban sprawl, and bigness is a formula for loneliness and disassociation. Many people believe in nothing but survival. I believe the spiritual door has been opened to our immortality, because to deny us this knowledge has proven to be counterproductive. In the spirit world of my experience, if something on earth isn't working, it can be changed. Amnesiac blocks were set in place with human beings to prevent preconditioned responses to certain karmic events. However, the benefits of amnesia may no longer outweigh the drawbacks of lives existing within a vacuum of chemically induced apathy. There are too many people trying to escape from reality because they do not see their identity as having purpose or meaning. 
drugs and alcohol aside, in overcrowded, high-tech societies around the world, people have an emptiness of spirit because they are ruled by their body-ego senses. They have little or no connection to their real self. Because each of us is a unique being, different from all others, it is incumbent upon those who desire internal peace to find their own spirituality. When we totally align ourselves to belief systems based upon the experience of other people, I feel we lose something of our individuality in the process. Oh, that is so fucking rich coming from him. I mean, really. His whole book. Think about the whole book that we've been over here. Oh, I think, uh... Yeah, you, you give away a piece of your individuality. Really, Michael Newton? This, this assertion is coming at the end of a book that you just laid out for us that, you know, it's, it's all for noble reasons. Everything happening is, is because it's supposed to be this way. Come on. When we totally align ourselves to belief systems based upon the experience of other people, I feel we lose something of our individuality in the process. Yeah. The road to self-discovery and shaping a personal philosophy, not designed by the doctrines of organizations, takes effort, but the rewards are great. There are many routes to this goal which begins by trusting in yourself. Camus tells us, both the rational and irrational lead to the same understanding. Truly, the path traveled matters little. The will to arrive is enough. Visions of the afterlife lie within each of us as a sanctuary while we travel the maze of Earth's pathways. The difficulty in uncovering fragments of our eternal home is due in no small part to life's distractions. It is not a bad thing to accept life as it is, asking no questions and assuming that in the end what is supposed to happen will happen. Yeah, no, it's, it's nothing wrong with not asking questions. There's nothing wrong with just being a meaningless drone your entire life and not questioning anything. Yeah, that's where you that's where you thrive the most. <laughs> I mean, really. That that's that's where you grow. That's where you make your biggest advancements in life in that lifetime is when you don't question anything. Yeah. So I think we should just, you know, shut everything down right now. Let's just not question anything, guys, right? I mean, let's just pack up our fucking bags and go home. I I guess. I think I just, I think I got to turn. Shit, it's almost nine o'clock. The news is almost on. I got to go turn on CNN. It is not a bad thing to accept life as it is. Asking no questions and assuming that in the end, what is supposed to happen will happen. However... For those with a longing to know more, simple acceptance of life is totally unsatisfying. For some travelers, life's mysteries cry out for attention, if being alive is to have any meaning. In the search for our own path of spirituality, it is wise to ask, what sort of behavioral code do I believe in? Some theologians suggest that Non-religious people are attempting to cut loose from moral and ethical responsibility dictated to us in Scripture from a higher authority. However, we are not evaluated after death by our religious associations, but rather by our conduct and values. Okay, well, let me just say this. There's some partial truth to what he just said, but also in near-death experiences we see how belief systems play a major role in all this stuff. How that if you, the system is banking on you buying into some of its preordained belief systems and hopefully clinging onto one of them or even a few of them. And what does it do? It tailors your experience at death, sometimes based on that. Sometimes it's based on deceased family members. Sometimes Jesus will pop up or Muhammad or Buddha or whatever, but they pop up based on that belief system. So your belief system can easily dictate 
what you're going to experience at the time of your death. And what does it do? It sucks you back into the system. So yeah, there's some truth to what he said and some bullshit too. Moral and ethical responsibility dictated to us in scripture from a higher authority. However, we are not evaluated after death by our religious associations, but rather by our conduct and values. In the spirit world I am familiar with, we are measured more by what we do for others rather than ourselves. If traditional religious activity serves your purpose and provides you with spiritual sustenance, you are probably motivated by a belief in scripture and perhaps the desire for comradeship in worship. The same attractions are true with people who join metaphysical groups and derive satisfaction from following the ideas of prescribed spiritual texts with like-minded people. While such practices may be comforting and edifying for your spiritual growth, it must be recognized that these pathways do not suit everyone. If there is no inner peace, it does not matter what sort of spiritual affiliation you have. Disengagement in life arises when we separate ourselves from our inner power by taking the position that we are all alone, without spiritual guidance, because no one upstairs is listening. I have great respect for people with abiding faith in something, since for a large part of my life I had no solid foundation of spirituality, despite my searching. There are atheists and agnostics who take the position that since religious and spiritual knowledge cannot be based upon natural or proven evidence, it is unacceptable. Simply having faith is not truly revealed knowledge to the skeptic. I identify with these people because I was one of them. My faith in the hereafter slowly began as an outgrowth of my participation with subjects in hypnosis. This is a discipline I believed in professionally before my research discoveries. Nevertheless, my own spiritual awareness was also the result of years of personal meditation and introspection about this research. Spiritual perception must be an individual quest, or it has no meaning. We are greatly influenced by our own immediate reality, and we can act on that reality one step at a time without the necessity of seeing too far into the distance. Even steps in the wrong direction give us insight into the many paths designed to teach us. Designed to teach us. Even steps in the wrong direction give us insight into the many paths designed to teach us. To bring the soul self into harmony with our physical environment, we are given freedom of choice to exercise free will in the search for the reasons why we are here. Free will within the confines of the system. Make no doubt about it. We have some semblance of free will, but it is so limited and so pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic what we truly have as far as free will goes. It's not this amazing thing that we have been sold. Okay? You have a body. You have a brain. You're cast down into it. And what happens? You're limited. I can't, you know, click my fucking heels and go flying off into the sky right now. I can't leave this system right now, even though I want to. Well, actually, you can, but you get what I'm saying. It's, it's, there's still limitations within the system because the body inherently has flaws in it. It has governors inside of it that prevent you from going and exercising the free will of anything. Anything and everything. If you don't have free will to do whatever you want when you want because you've got this body, well, that's not really free will, is it? You have some. We have some. It's just very limiting. Exercise free will in the search for the reasons why we are here. On the road of life... We must take responsibility for all our decisions yeah, without blaming other people for life's setbacks that bring unhappiness. As I mentioned, 
To be effective in our mission, we are expected to help others on their paths whenever possible. By helping others... To be effective in our mission. See? There's the mission thing. We see this all the time in near-death experiences. Nothing new. Just another day. Uh, how Again, how these all these topics uh, converge and create... Or not create, but expose the Matrix Reincarnation Soul Trap. Because... You have to have all the different aspects to this thing to truly see it. Otherwise, you're just going to have bits and pieces here. And you might say to yourself, eh, well, you know, I think something's off, but I don't really know for sure. So keep an eye on my upcoming series, uh, How to Research the Matrix Reincarnation Soul Trap and Prove It to Yourself. It's going to be a pretty in-depth series. Uh, and, uh, my hope is that anyone new or on the fence will, uh, utilize that guide and go out and research for themselves. That bring unhappiness. As I mentioned, to be effective in our mission, we are expected to help others on their paths whenever possible. By helping others, we help ourselves. Reaching out to others is inhibited when we nurture our own uniqueness to such an extent that we become totally self-absorbed. However, being an absentee landlord in your own house makes you ineffective as a person as well. You were not given your body by a chance of nature. It was selected for you by spiritual advisors, and after previewing their offerings of other host bodies, you agreed to accept the body you now have. Yeah. Thus, you are not a victim of circumstance. Uh... That's cute. Yeah, we chose the body, but how do we choose the body? Under peer pressure, bullshit masters, bullshit deceivers, bullshit soul groups, bullshit everything. And we had limited choice, yet we did choose, so that does have to be addressed and acknowledged. Can't be just thrown to the wind and say, oh, oh, oh. But for as much as, yes, we did consent to it, we were deceived in a major way. So uh, Newton, of course, explains everything away like he does so well. Nature. It was selected for you by spiritual advisors. Exactly, Miss Ellie. Choice by coercion. Yep. Well said. Effective as a person as well. You were not given your body by a chance of nature. It was selected for you by spiritual advisors, and after previewing their offerings of other host bodies, you agreed to accept the body you now have. Thus, you are not a victim of circumstance. You are entrusted with your body to be an active participant in life, not a bystander. We must not lose sight of the idea that we accepted this sacred contract of life, and this means the roles we play on earth are actually greater than ourselves. Our soul energy was created by a higher authority than we can know in our present state of development. Consequently, we must focus on who we are as a person to find that fragment of divinity within us. The only limitations to personal insight are self-imposed. If the spiritual paths of others have no relevance to you, this does not mean the way designed for your needs is non-existent. The reason for our being who we are is a major truth in life. Where one person may find an aspect of that truth manifested to them, it will not be in the same place for another. Essentially, we are alone with our soul. Yet people who feel lonely haven't quite found themselves. Self-discovery of the soul has to do with self-possession. The capturing of our individual essence is like falling in love. Something within you lying dormant is awakened at a point in your life by a stimulus. The soul flirts with you at first, tempting you to go further with delights that are only seen from a distance. The initial attraction of self-discovery begins with an almost playful touching of the conscious by the unconscious mind. As the intensity of wanting to fully possess our inner self grows, we are drawn irresistibly into a more intimate connection. An intimate connection that is thwarted 
and uh, ha does nothing but attempt to distract us and take us away from discovering ourselves. See what I'm saying? It, it, you, you... <laughs> Newton makes it sound like, oh, well, uh, you know, eventually you'll find yourself. And you're, you know, you're desiring to tap into that spirit, that true essence. But what happens when you, on, when you bust that open, right? You're still surrounded by the control system. You're, you're surrounded by the narratives that the control system wants you to buy into. <laughs> and you have someone like Michael Newton ready and waiting in the wings to take advantage of you and spin this shit so the so the realm is content and happy and uh all it does is it leaves you still lost that's all it does it leaves you sitting there twiddling your thumbs and then gives you the illusion that you are starting to find yourself when in fact all you're doing is running into matrix blockades left right trying to weave in and out of that shit good luck good luck it's a, it's it's all it's close to impossible it's not impossible but it's pretty damn close i mean when i think about how few people know about the soul trap i mean that i mean the system is running like a fine well-oiled machine it, it really is all i see are just, you know, we're such a small group who knows this information and can see it and call it out for what it is. But the bulk of humanity, the, the 99 point, probably what, 98% of people, maybe nine, if we're being generous, 99% of the people are still lost in the sauce and under the delusion that they've woken up and started to find themselves while well, the true... The biggest truth is right here with what we're talking about. Knowing our soul becomes a marriage of fidelity to one's self. The fascinating aspect about self-discovery is that when you hear that inner voice, you instantly recognize it. Based on my practice, I am convinced that everyone on this planet has a personal spiritual guide. Spirit guides speak to our inner mind if we are receptive. While some guides are more easily reached than others, each of us has the ability to call upon and be heard by these guides. There are no accidents in life, yet people get confused by what they perceive to be randomness. It is this philosophy that works against thoughts of spiritual order. It becomes an easy next step to feel we have no control in our lives, and trying to find ourselves is pointless since nothing we do matters anyway. Believing in the randomness of events negatively influences our reaction to situations and allows us to avoid thinking about explanations for them. Having a fatalistic outlook on life by saying, it's God's will or even it's my karma, contributes to inaction and lack of purpose. That which is meaningful in life comes in small pieces or large chunks all at one time. And Self believing in karma does that same thing, Dr. Newton, right? But, well, you know, we fail to acknowledge that, right? It allows us to avoid thinking about explanations for them. Having a fatalistic outlook on life by saying, it's God's will, or even it's my karma, contributes to inaction and lack of purpose. Mm. That which is meaningful in life comes in small pieces or large chunks all at one time. Self-awareness can take us beyond what we thought was our original destination. Karma is the setting in motion of those conditions on our path that foster learning. The concept of a source orchestrating all of this need not be pretentious. The spiritual externalist waits for reunification with a creator after death, while the internalist feels part of a oneness each day. Spiritual insight comes to us in quiet, introspective, subtle moments which are manifested by the power of a single thought.
Life is a matter of constant change toward fulfillment. Our place in the world today may be different tomorrow. We must learn to adapt to these different perspectives in life, because that too is part of the plan for our development. In doing so, there is a transcendence of self from the masking process of a temporary outer shell to that which lies deep within our permanent soul-mind. To uplift the human mind from feelings of disenchantment, we must expand our consciousness while forgiving ourselves for mistakes. I believe it is vital to our mental health that we laugh at ourselves and the foolish predicaments we get into along the road. Forgiving ourselves for mistakes, yet Newton is king karma. Newton is uh, king judgment. Newton is king... uh... Earth is a school. I mean, these are the narratives that we've heard throughout both his books, Journey of Souls, Destiny of Souls. And for anyone new, again, I I covered uh, Journey of Souls cover to cover as well. You can find a playlist in my channel if you're interested in watching that. I also have the Matrix Reincarnation Soul Trap playlist, which includes it as well. Life is full of conflicts, and the struggle pain, and happiness we experience are all reasons for our being here. Each day is a new beginning. Yes, each day. I have a final quote that came from a subject who is preparing for another departure from the spirit world into a new incarnation on earth. I think his statement offers a fitting conclusion to this book. Coming to earth is about traveling away from our home to a foreign land. Some things seem familiar, but most are strange until we get used to them, especially conditions which are unforgiving. Our real home is a place of absolute peace, total acceptance, and complete love. As souls separated from our home, we can no longer assume these beautiful features will be present around us. On earth we must learn to cope with intolerance, anger, and sadness, while searching for joy and love. We must not lose our integrity along the way, sacrificing goodness for survival and acquiring attitudes either superior or inferior to those around us. We know that living in an imperfect world will help us to appreciate the true meaning of perfection. We ask for courage and humility before our journey into another life. As we grow in awareness, so will the quality of our existence. This is how we are tested. Passing this test is our destiny. Okay, so, congratulations. <laughs> we all made it. <laughs> we finished this, this shit show. <laughs> all right, so uh, before we close out the stream, I want to send a special thank you out to each and every one of you uh, who have sat through these streams and watched the replays and everything. It is so, so much appreciated. Thank you. And, um, yeah, just thank you. I mean, it, 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 it's great to see that more people are catching on to the scam and deception that is the earth realm and the astral sub realms of control. And I just want to say a couple more things that are just to let you guys know that I am working on a website. Uh, It's still in the early phases, but what it's going to do is act as a resource hub and community space where we will have a, forum and a chat room and uh, a way for us to not have to rely on something like youtube or any sort of other external website um it's the problem is is i'm trying to make sure that i find a hosting service that is uh, probably on the blockchain and doesn't have any censorship worries at all where basically you can say and do whatever the hell you want and not have to worry about getting canceled especially in these days because with the with the way things are panning out uh 
it, anything could happen at any time. So uh, it's really important that we have a dedicated space that we can go to if something should happen. But for the time being, uh, everything's going to be still on YouTube and Odyssey. And uh, I also have a Twitter and an Instagram. I have two YouTube backup channels. All this stuff is in the description. If you haven't joined Odyssey yet as well, there's an invite link there. And by using that invite link, you help out the channel over on Odyssey's platform. Uh, it, it throws like eight library coins and I'm able to promote the channel over there with, with the with the small coins that they give you for the referral. And then you also get something too. It doesn't cost anything. If you're a creator too here on YouTube, you can what's great is you can transfer your entire channel over to them. So you have essentially a free backup space to put your content in as too. And again, it doesn't cost anything. It's it's a great, great site. And uh no censorship as of yet. You know, I'm not gonna act a fool and say that it won't happen down the road but right now it seems like a good good alternative to at least check out and um so yeah i think that's gonna leave things where we're at um also if anyone's interested in joining the astral projection and lucid dreaming discord just leave a comment afterwards for a link and i will provide that i also have started youtube membership so if anyone wants some uh bonus content there are three tiers that you can uh, sign up for and it also helps the channel and some future aspirations that i have there's already a members community post uh available to kind of give you an idea as to what your contributions will do towards helping future works here on the channel and again nothing is ever required but always appreciated uh i do not share information that i don't feel is important uh privately i always share everything that i have that i that i know has value to being able to crack this wide open for anybody because number one number one with what i'm doing here is about spreading awareness to as many people as possible and being able to it's it's an it's a form of activism because i remember back in the day you know a lot of us probably felt this way like oh if we just go out with a picket sign and do this you know maybe we'll or sign this petition and yada 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 that we might be able to actually change something like in government or whatever but you know you become older you realize oh yeah that shit's not gonna do anything so but this this topic is one that can help who knows how many people escape and not have to worry about coming back. So uh, I'll just conclude very briefly that doing your part, no matter how big or how small, by even if it's just sharing my content, uh, learning this stuff on your own and doing your own blog pass, blog, eh, blog post or YouTube video, or Twitter post, or Instagram post, or Facebook, whatever the heck you got, website, all this stuff. Just try and do a small thing towards helping others find this information. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to leave that at that. I, I very greatly appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for sticking around for this this uh power series <laughs> and uh okay so we made it through all 70 cases much love and blessings to you all and i will see you again very soon and the research series will be starting sometime within the next week or two i'll be coming out with parts one and two thank you again